também. For those of you just joining the meeting, live translation in Spanish is available and members of the public wishing to listen in Spanish can join the Spanish channel by clicking on the interpretation icon in the Zoom toolbar. It looks like a globe. Once you join the Spanish channel, we recommend you shut off the main audio so you only hear the Spanish translation. Alejandro, can you please repeat that statement in Spanish? Sorry, I think I was muted. Esta eh, reunión va a ser eh, interpretada al español por intérpretes calificados. Si desea escucharlo en español, por favor, uh, toque el símbolo de eh, globo terráqueo y ahí se abre la opción para escucharlo en español y también va a estar disponible en distintos medios la grabación de la reunión completa. Thank you, Alejandro. I'll move you over to the Spanish channel for interpretation with Pablo. If you guys can coordinate um, one Thank you. interpreter speaking at a time. Thank you very much. Sure.
All right, we'll go ahead and gavel back in. Uh, Madam City Clerk, can you please call the roll? Yes, uh, Council Member Tibbetts will be absent from the meeting today, so I will start with Council Member Schwedhelm. Here. Council Member Sawyer. Here. Council Member Fleming. Here. Council Member Alvarez. I see you, but. Oh, uh, present. I'm sorry. Thank present. you. Vice Mayor Rogers. Present. And Mayor Rogers. Here. Let the record show that all council members are present with the exception of council member Tibbetts. Great. Thank you so much, Madam City Clerk. We are doing a hybrid meeting today. We have uh, both the opportunity for folks to give public comment in the council chambers. If you do come in and like to give comment, go ahead and give your cards up to Julie Guzzi up at the top. If you're interested in participating via Zoom, you can also hit the raise hand feature on your Zoom. But that will go on to our study session for the day. Uh, that's item 3.1, Mr. Assistant City Manager. Thank you, Mayor, Vice Mayor. Uh, Item 3.1, CalPERS Unfunded Pension Liability Strategies. Jan Mazik, our Chief Financial Officer, will be giving the presentation today. I see the presentation popped up. Do we have Jan? Yeah, I had a little bit of trouble getting in there. Good afternoon, Mayor. Good afternoon, Council Members. Um, as we committed to doing back in July, um, we said we would follow up with a, a comprehensive strategy for addressing the city's unfunded liability, and we'll do that today. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the, the discussion today um, is just to remind what the challenge is, what the, ch you know, the issue we're trying to solve, provide a historical perspective, um, some information on the city's uh, pension plans, which has been updated since the last presentation you saw, um, talk about the pension obligation bonds themselves, and uh, some longer term considerations and our summary of recommendations and as always, um, provide you know an update on what the risks are. And also, um, one of the requests was that we give a um, a summary of how the city's existing pension bonds have performed, and we'll do that at the end of the presentation. Next slide, please. So the former. Um, so just to remind um, some terms, and yes, some of these are nuanced to talking about pensions, but the actuarial report is a report that CalPERS does for us each year. Um, the actual information lags by several months, so it feels like almost two years, but it's actually done every year. Our most recent valuation was done fiscal year for FY20. Um, bases, I mean, those are really sort of the payment schedules we had. At the last discussion we had on pensions, there were 65, they're now going to be 70. But those reflect, they're really loans, um, individual loans to CalPERS. The discount rate is 7%. I refer to it frequently as a hurdle rate, but it's at the rate at which the debt we owe to CalPERS is calculated. Funded status is just, you know, what are assets, liabilities minus assets, that represents um, the funded amount and the calculation of percentage for miscellaneous, fire, and police. Normal costs are the costs we pay every year for employees. And then in addition to the normal costs, we pay the UAL or the unfunded liability. I'm going to introduce the term, um, the 115 trust, which is a tool that we use to set aside pension funds separate and apart from other reserves. And as we talk about, you know, strategies for managing the liability going forward, that the Section 115 trust will come up. Next slide, please. 
So this, you know, just to remind um, of the challenge we're trying to solve, you know, unfunded liabilities, your city of Santa Rosa is not unique. Um, it's a challenge for most governments across the country. In California, I think perhaps they seem some of the largest, largely because we don't really have the tax alternatives to pay for those liabilities as, you know, other states um, do across the country. So we will make between fiscal year, the current fiscal year, stepping up next year actually, um, and 2036, an additional amount of $110 million in payments. And those payments are increasing and then they begin to, to decrease and return to pre-22 levels in, FY, in fiscal year 36. But beginning next year, you know, some of these uh, payment range, these payments range from an additional two and a half, half million all the way up to almost 13 million. Next slide, please. This is a slide we saw in July. And solving this, or at least mitigating some of this, is consequential to the city's financial well being. The column to the far right, those are the summary of payments over the next 14 years, totaling $110.8 million. That is above the baseline that we would have paid in the current fiscal year. So if you consider where we are budgetarily today and just consider which each of the other additional costs we have, in addition to the unfunded liability, we might conclude that do nothing may not be an option, um, or it would be certainly a difficult option. Next slide, please. The next slide. I captured this only because, you know, there was a discussion back in 2012 talking about the challenges for the unfunded liability, and they certainly pale based, you know, relative to what we're talking about today. But even back then, um, it was a challenge. And, you know, as the article, as just a short blurb says, you know, there was a million dollar increase one year in, in 2012 to be exact, and soaring costs of an unfunded liability to 127 million. We'll see some of the reasons and for the con and concerns um, and the corresponding reforms that then followed in 2013 that were proposed by the state. Next slide, please. So here are some of the precipitating events. Somewhere in the late, you know, just to, you know, as an anecdote, somewhere in the late 1990s, I think I did a $400 million pension financing for the city of Oakland. And it wasn't long after that when um, returns started soaring, as partly because we people were putting additional assets into plans, and then pensions became overfunded, and what retirement systems did as a result was give enhanced benefits. Some of these you will see here. Although not the full amount, um, you know, with increasing investments during that period, you know, pension, those pension assets really incentivized people to do just that, but not really anticipating that the reverse might happen um, in an economic downturn. So the same thing occurred in many jurisdictions, not just city, city of Santa Rosa, and we know, you know, really how that ended very abruptly in 2008, 2009. And so I would argue, and I've maintained, and I think most of us that have spent our time, if we've done consulting in governments, you know, the financial crisis, governments really never fully recovered. There were really structural financial differences between that pre-economic circumstance and the economic circumstances we have now faced, not only even in governments, but in other businesses as well. And so one of the things that we saw going forward, you know, a lot of, a lot of the pre-financial crisis, we were busy financing projects and doing, you know, infrastructure. You know, post that, people, it's been much slower and people are spending more time and concerns on what I would call more operational and strategic urgencies. Next slide, please. 
So in 2013, um, reforms were proposed that the city had to, not only the city of Santa Rosa, but you know, cities across um, California to implement certain changes. So specific um, to the controls that went into effect or reform that, were, that took effect in 2013, you know, increased uh, contributions for public safety. You can see the increased amounts from nine to 12 for police. Fire increased, you know, um, 150 basis points. Reduced formula for new hires after January 1, 2013. Miscellaneous also took reductions, 3% at 60 to 2% at 62. Police and fire also did the same, 3% at 50 to 2.7% at 57. And then what was also implemented was a three-year average versus single highest final year compensation. These are reforms that were specific to the city of Santa Rosa in 2013. Next slide, please. Someone had asked for a comparative chart and we attempted to do it here. In each of the three plans, you know, what it meant for classic, which is, you know, the employees pre-2013, and then PEPRA um, and new employees after that date, and some of the comparisons between miscellaneous, safety, and police. And um, I think a lot of what I just said has been summarized here with a little bit of um, additional information as to highest year caps and the like. Um, these benefits that um, are attributable to classic employees are not alterable under the California rule. Um, CalPERS does not break out PEPRA versus classic employees. However, much of the UAL, probably less than 1%, is related to a UAL for uh, PEPRA. Next slide, please. Specific to this, the city's pension plans, you'll see, I think it's the next slide, where we talk about um, what changed from last year to this year. There will be a change in the unfunded liability again. Um, but these are the contributory variables. Changes in benefit levels, increased employer contributions, changes in assumptions are a big one, demographics, age, number of retire of employees, retirement age, mortality rates, compensation changes, the number of retirees and beneficiaries, and investment returns, both gains and losses. Next slide, please. So back in July, um, you did see uh, the UAL or the unfunded liability. This is a high cost debt that we have with CalPERS. Think of it as a past due loan. Um, miscellaneous police and fire um, on a combined basis, the pension funds are together uh, represent about 70% funding. Um, in the liability calculation that was just done, for fiscal year ending July 2020, um, that, you know, the, the, the liability of itself went up, but so did the market value of assets. And overall, the funding of the respective systems remains unchanged. But there is a change, um, and it's roughly about, you know, $26 million higher than it was last year. One other comment I'd like to make, you know, actuarial returns, investment returns, which is a big factor um, impacting funding, um, for 2020, it was 4.7% versus the actuarial rate, the rate or the discount rate, you know, as I call the hurdle rate. So it underperformed um, performance. On the other side of that, we also know how FY21 performed. It was a very good year. Um, and while we haven't seen the impact, of that, um, returns then were about 21%. Chances are we're not gonna see the results of that until next year. Um, one corresponding event that is likely to happen 
is that CalPERS is expected to lower um, its UAL rate from 7%. We don't know if it's going to be at 6.8% or at 6.5%, but that's the discussion given the returns that we've had. But the city will also see benefits as a result of 20% plus returns. Next slide, please. This is just a history of performance. You can see the 4.7% performance um, in a fiscal year 20. You can see the impact of FY21 returns. And um, the discount rate remains unchanged until such time as we there's a formal announcement about it. Next slide, please. So this is the shape, the one within the red circle that we showed on the first page, just in different colors. This comprises the um, fire, police, and miscellaneous, you know, the proportions of the payments that will be made um, to CalPERS. Um, we shared this back in July, and just a reminder, this is really the problem we are attempting to solve here, this specifically. Next slide, please. I would say that the scale of the problem requ requires a scale of solution. And, you know, that's one of the reasons so many issuers in California in particular, because there are no other choices at hand, um, attempt to solve the POB um, issue or the unfunded liability issue with pension bonds. Yes, as part of the strategy, um, I will recommend that. But I think more consequentially is that strategic application of the funds is also required to perhaps get the most benefit out of using pension bonds. So pension bonds tend to work across the entire spectrum. No, we're not going to suggest the city do a $425 million financing. We don't think that would be prudent. Um, it will be some portion of that, probably likely to be $200 million. If we've got a $110 million problem with CalPERS, it will require grossing up some, to some degree to be able to solve it. So pension bonds work across the system, but there are other tools that we attempt to use. So I have listed here, and I know we talked about it, and it says used to buy down portions of debt. So a tax exempt exchange where, you know, if we had a capital, they require participation of non-general fund sources of monies. So if we had a capital program that we plan to finance on a tax exempt basis, which is a cheaper cost of cap capital than taxable bonds, which pension obligation bonds require, um, we would do an exchange for those costs of capital and you'd finance the capital projects at a much lower rate and then use the cash to buy down the unfunded liability. And that would save us obviously issuing pension bonds. Um, reserves and surplus one-time monies, um, you know, one of the questions that had been asked was, you know, does 10 million make sense? And yes, it would have, and I think I include a chart on that, um, because the goal will be to get rid of our most co our costliest portion of debt first. Next slide, please. So I did mention that pension bonds would be part of our strategy. The first step in the process, however, is to um, have it validated in court. And what that means um, is that we would, you know, it falls under the constitutional debt limit, meaning it doesn't require voter approval. The debt, I think, or the debt we're talking about is a CalPERS unfunded li liability, which exists. And so the financing is termed a refinancing. Um, in today's environment, we can, uh, uh, we can finance that liability at perhaps less than three and a half percent, rather than paying the CalPERS discount rate, which it still remains at 7%. Bond Council, um, given the exception to the constitutional debt limit, 
requires that they be validated in superior court. Um, the filing for such validation is probably 50,000, which would be reimbursable were the city to issue bonds at some date in the future. During the validation period, that's usually when we would take the time to deliver, you know, what the recommended plan of finance would be and to do other um, documentation, select the team and um, return to council. But any approval ahead of the validation process requires council approval. Any additional step post validation also requires that we return to the city council. The validation action typically requires about 180 to 210 days plus a 30 day date of appeal. Next slide, please. This is the, the economics of a pension obligation bond. It's just general, um, not specific to the city of Santa Rosa. So if we assume the borrowing rate, our borrowing rate of three and a half percent, which is less than, which is half of the uh, CalPERS discount rate. So it doesn't matter the size. Pension bonds all work the same way. What varies are scale and just leverage. So the word we use is, the correct word is, it's, it's a, it, you've heard the term arbitrage, meaning you're borrowing in one market or taking advantage of rates in one market and expecting to benefit in another market. That other market being a deposit into CalPERS at a rate of 7% or you know, the discount rate. So in an ideal circumstance, the best returns, the best performance of pension bonds is to be able, one, to exceed uh, funding status improved when we're able to invest at higher than the CalPERS rate. We also benefit when we invest at higher than what the rate at which we borrowed. Where it really doesn't work is if we should have to, is if Popper's returns are lower than the three and a half percent rate at which we borrow, because then it just compounds the borrowing problem. So all POBs work this way. And if people are puzzled, I'm happy to go this slide over again. But the goal would be certainly to exceed our borrowing rate, but better yet, to also exceed the CalPERS um, borrowing rate, which currently is 7%. You know, if this were this year, we would have done really well, as our returns will show, the year worked out exceedingly well. Next slide, please. So over the fat past four years, um, there were 55 pension bonds down, done in California, exceeding 6 billion. There are another 12 deals that we know about that are totaling about 3 billion. Some of those are pretty sizable deals, such as the city of San Jose. But the reason, you know, what's really fueling that issuance is that we're really in a very low interest rate environment. And there hasn't really been any upward rate momentum as yet. There are bigger spreads, which is what we call them, between the low rate at which we can borrow and the rate of return at CalPERS. I'm using an estimated rate of 3.5%. It's actually still in the twos that people can still borrow in the high twos. Um, but we're using, for just sake of argument, 3.5%. We've learned a lot of le lessons um, made for the, from the earlier days of pension bond financings. We'll even touch on one of those um, later. And then I think it's the combined effects of COVID, general economic disruption, but the scale of the problem, which I talked about at the beginning of the presentation, requires really a scale of response and thus the borrowing. What hurts pension bonds? You know, we want pension bonds to perform the minute you put them into the portfolio. If it's adverse to that, it really, it hurts. Doesn't mean we can't recover, but it does hurt. So, you know, it just becomes a drag on the overall issue. Poorly structured bonds, such like interest only bonds, which we're not gonna propose, 
um, you know, is a challenge or other backloaded debt structures. The goal is to sort of do it evenly, you know, make equal investments and don't, let's not get fancy with the structures because that complicates, you know, the risks. Next slide, please. So one, we benefit just by adding assets into the system. Um, I think you'll also see evidence of that later in the presentation and what, you know, how does that compound? Um, savings as a result of lower debt service payments to bondholders versus the requirements to make pension contribution uh, payments to CalPERS, you know, re to reduce the UAL, that gives us really budgetary savings. It also gives us cash flow savings. Market timing, as I talked about matters early on in the program, would help a lot um, so that you get build up some surplus that helps to sort of um, inoculate against future market declines. And obviously the time value of money, because as our investments accelerate, we increase the compounding effect of earnings in CalPERS. Next slide, please. What hurts? Um, if the pension plan uh, earns less over the life of the program than the interest paid on the bonds. That was that first component that you saw. We issue at three and a half and the pension plan returns turns to. That really hurts because it compounds the problem. Market timing um, also impacts performance. You know, poor performance earlier on in the program hurts, um, but if it's also less than CalPERS discount, you know, or and less than the bond, it is costly. You know, from a credit risk perspective, um, you know, the idea is that from they want us to have a comprehensive program. Rating agencies, if we're just issuing bonds, that in and of itself gives them concerns. And similarly, complex structures that are viewed as budgetary me mechanisms are considered to be cre uh, credit negatives. So the goal is to put together a comprehensive program that's constructive to not only the program itself, but also longer term financially. Next slide, please. As I mentioned earlier, our intent is not to issue 100%. Um, it's probably going to be 50% or something less. Um, dollar cost average into the market. I think we all know what that terms means, but what that term means, but investing in a variety of environments, and we can do that in more ways than one, um, also help. Um, you know, when we borrow matters a lot and the structures we use also matters a lot. An issue when the time is right. You know, if we prepared financing documents, and at the conclusion of the validation period, interest rates were at 4%. I would probably say, let's wait, let's see what interest rates do. I think our bogey is three and a half percent, but as I mentioned, um, borrowing rates are even quite a bit less than three and a half percent today. Next slide, please. Um, you know, as with all financial strategies, diverse plans, diverse strategies like, I think I touched on this before, allocation between funds, non-general fund sources. Um, we talked about tax ex exchanges, pension obligation bonds, uses of reserves and one-time monies. They all matter and they all matter from a credit perspective and how, what the rating agencies are likely to give us as a credit rating. So the next section, if we can go there, please. Um, here is a summary of considerations um, that I think would be valuable, um, both from a financial as well, including pension and, um, and budgetarily. Next slide, please. I put this in here um, because I know it's difficult to think about a 400, $425 million challenge today and think about whether $10 million matters or it doesn't. It actually does, and quite a bit. And I go back to the question that was asked um, before about what would happen if the city made a $10 million investment. 
small amount of money. Um, I talk about from a strategic standpoint, you wanna take out your high cost debt first. That doesn't always get us the best budgetary benefit. So what we did was we compared, remember I used the word bases, short base, those means the short term loans, the front end of the curve, this entire curve, the ones in orange. And then we looked at longer term loans. It was a single longer term loan um, that we looked at what would happen if we use the $10 million to discreetly remove that from the from, from the loan, the overall CalPERS loan. So the shorter ones got us the biggest budgetary benefit, the actual savings year over year, a million and a half, um, creeping down to 149,000. Um, the over, but together, the financial benefit was $13.6 million. The one, the most expensive part of all those loans, one single um, loan that we took out, you know, we got substantially budget less budgetary benefits. Um, they escalated nearer because it's your highest cost debt. But on a financial basis, it really got us the benefit of about $23 million. So that's, you know, as you think about it, it doesn't necessarily take a whole lot to make a little bit, to make a valuable difference in the liability. Next slide, please. So pension strategies across the country are very different. Um, in California, it's bonds first, because I think we have, a, a, you know, cities have a larger prob problem, but we have limited tax alternatives. Thus, we go to bonds because we don't have other options. So, um, but just looking at six places, debt financing, um, altered service delivery in California, um, Houston did a more modern, they, they buffered earnings. So CalPERS is very volatile. What Houston said is, look, we're gonna set aside X amount per year to deal with volatility in our portfolio. Um, voter reforms in San Diego, pension renegotiations in many communities, again, um, further east than where we are, increased pension contributions, wage freezes, pension caps um, done, you know, in Hartford, Connecticut, and upward revenue adjustments prioritized for pension payments. You know, that's, you know, for those where we, where there, you know, that have flexibility um, to make those adjustments to tax basis. Next slide, please. So I found it helpful um, to frame, I thought, what might be goals for the system overall, which is obviously to ensure sustainability for people to who we promised retirements, that the funding is there and that they will receive as planned. Um, I think another goal is to reduce the annual burden of those climbing costs for the city. Um, budgetarily, that's going to hurt. Um, over the next 14 years. I think if we can minimize or eliminate the rising contributions during that triangle we talked about, that would go a long way um, towards relieving that budgetary as well as cash flow pressure. And recycling savings. So we'll show an example of recycled savings, but recycled savings just means that by savings you get. So if we saved money, budgetarily and, you know, we amended our uh, fund balance policies to say we'll commit to X. If we're able to put that back into the system, I think it will pay off in benefit over the longer term. Next slide, please. So here are a summary of considerations, as I call them, and actions building fund assets by fan financing, and I'm talking about CalPERS specifically, by financing a portion of the UAL. The benefit of that is both budgetary and financial considerations 
And that will weigh into the decision of how much we, to the extent we issue or how much we decide to issue. There's a certain cadence to financial success, I believe, and a comprehensive approach is likely one that takes into consideration cash, investments, consider, con, um, consistent budgetary funding, and recycling of savings. We could establish a pension funding policy. I know I've mentioned that before um, as a subset of our general fund policy and to integrate if we wished um, or thought it would be helpful, an alternative to or what I would call smoothing of the volatility. Establish a 115 trust if the council wanted to segregate funds from general fund policy into a CALP unfunded liability policy. I would suggest that we establish a cross-section employee working group to come up with, devise and propose some moderate, you know, pension reform strategies, um, which is a subset um, of budget strategies that people have been, we've begun to talk about with employee, or we're beginning to talk about, and then continue to take, um, so you may or may not do, know this, we take a 3% discount if we prepay our unfunded liability um, every year, which we do, um, it's 3%. Um, that's not a given, it depends on the interest rate environment because we'll have foregone interest earnings. And we, but with, that's something the city already does and we should come con continue to do it. Next slide, please. I would recommend that we begin the validation process and which would require us to return to city council for approval of the legal documents that we are required to file in court. And with council approval, initiate the validation action, further develop during that period and finance, finalize a plan of finance for a potential POB issuance that would still require we return to the long-term planning and financial audit committee and provide a preliminary plan of finance. Um, and with the judgment issued, which is what happens at the end of the validation process, we would return to council for full transaction approval if market conditions warrant. So that, you know, 12 actions would be the summary of recommendations. Next slide, please. Um, next slide, please. Um, these are the risks. I really think most of these have been mitigated just with time, lessons learned, and transactions have, be, have evolved. Um, you know, it's just progress. And I think most issuers who are doing pension financings are pretty much doing straight vanilla financings. Um, no gimmicks, no other hard to solve issues. But timing is everything. And um, I think that should factor in the decision. Um, as a risk mitigation strategy. Next slide, please. The rest of the presentation relates to, this component of the presentation relates to analyses of the pension bonds that the city of Santa Rosa did back in 2003, as well as in 2013. So what I would say is the city does have a history with pension bonds. Um, these two bonds were for very different purposes, however. The first series, which was the 03, was intended to fund a $50 million liability. Um, that was an existing UAL. They did it with part variable rate, 20 million plus, and $30 million in fixed rate. You know, one of the rate, one of the risks that we talked about was variable rate risks, and it's not the variable rate that's the risk. It's the fact that when you issue variable rate, those bonds are redeemable every seven days or every 28 days, which means that you also need a letter of credit to do that issuance and letters of credit and the associated banks move in and out of the market. So they're not always a constant. That seems to have been what happened. And then, so those bonds were then refinanced in 2013 um, and used to, for a variety of, well, variable rate, they had to redeem all the bonds 
And so they pay down the principal on the variable rate, use a portion to make debt service funds. So very different purposes for why those bonds were issued. Next slide, please. I would admit that this is a very complex analysis to do. I didn't do it. I had one of the consultants do it, but because um, you're really looking at sort of any number of variables. Um, Stan, you know, to go back and look at a debt that's 20 years old, um, what does that look like and how do we try to construct it? But here are just some fact patterns. Um, standard refinancing is one of the things we looked at. What are the fixed UAL payments? What is the loan? What are those fixed payments? The existing liability on the balance sheet, we didn't report that back in 2003. Budgetary savings, proceeds go to CalPERS at the time of issuance. And then the things that we talk about that really challenge or make or break the financing, market timing, when it was done, you know, during that period of time, the, the, the city was able to earn some really beneficial returns early on in the program, which really helped. So um, next slide, please. So the uh, analysis is focused solely on the 2003s because the 2013s were not funding purposes. That was purely a refinancing of the 2003s. Here are the fact patterns issued at 485. The CalPERS discount rate at that time was seven and three quarters. Um, UAL savings. Now, what the city took up front um, was 24.2 million, or not up front, actually, the black. Throughout the life of the bonds, those were budgetary and cash flow savings, and it just got folded in as a part of the budget. The, what, the two white boxes at the front are interest-only payments rather than interest and principal payments um, there. And so the question to be asked is, was the city better off having issued pension obligation bonds in 2003? Next slide, please. I think the answer is generally yes. You got a benefit of $24.5 million, as I mentioned, in present value savings, or, or they're not present value across the amortization. They weren't taken up front. They were spread throughout the life of the bonds. Um, the alternative question that we asked is, what would have happened if those savings had been recycled, that's what we mean, reinvested in CalPERS. And given what CalPERS returned during those periods, if that program were done throughout the entirety of the program, there perhaps would have been an additional $31 million benefit. I'm not particularly fond of revisiting financings that were done. I think people do them at the time for certain reasons and needs. And um, I think the city did um, and certainly benefited from it um on the 2003s so with that and the, the the last slide on the presentation um is just a summary or the math of the analyses and with that i will conclude my remarks and take questions all right thank you so much i'll start with council members at the dais are there any questions Council members on Zoom. All right, I'm not seeing any questions from council members. We'll go to our public comment on the study session. If you're interested in providing comment, go ahead to either hit the raise hand feature on your Zoom, or it looks like we have one card for in the chambers. We'll start with you, Mr. DeWitt. Hello. May I take this mask off because I'm so far away from folks? We're uh, asking folks to keep their masks on while they're in the chambers. All righty. My name is Dwayne DeWitt. I'm from Roseland, and I remember some of these discussions about the bonds almost 20 years ago in 2003. I'm surprised none of you council members asked questions today because this is a very complex topic, and I don't think you're going to get all the information you need in just one or two study sessions. I think it's really important that we remember back in the day of the turn of the century, the big concerns were that we had such a large unfunded 
pension liability that's still there and still growing in many ways. And I am a believer that renegotiations of the pension project should be undertaken. And there should perhaps be the model that Hartford, Connecticut follows, and you might even go for those freezes. The idea of this trust that the IRS allows, the uh, approach of setting things up with them could be quite helpful to you. IRS 115 trust, it was discussed, but you didn't discuss it much. So you really need to look into these things because the possibility of the liabilities growing is real. We may have an even worse economy in the next couple of years due to what happened with the pandemic. One of the things that's of real interest to a number of people is going back to these people who we've made millionaires with their pension and haven't been working for years and are still grabbing down lots of money. This is something that you don't owe them that. You can say, oh, well, we signed something, it's an obligation. It's like, wait a minute, back when those things were being negotiated in the 90s, they didn't do the taxpayers right. And I think that if you have any of these working groups, you should make sure and include the taxpayers. Sonoma County Taxpayer Association would have just as good a voice as just the employees. This is really important. You've got people, and the county does also, who essentially made millions of dollars working for the city pushing papers, retire early, and are set for life, can live 30, 40 years more maybe. And one of the prime examples, I like firemen, I like police officers, I like they do well. I know some of them, grew up with some of them, who retired in their 50s and are doing really well now. Millionaires based on pension. This is not something that the taxpayer should be responsible for. In the private sector, the market rate, they're taking pensions out. They're basically setting it up so that it's like, hey, it's a right to work situation. Be glad you got the job. This is what you got. This is America. It's a capitalist country. It's a free market situation. Taxpayers have the right to be unlabored. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. DeWitt. I see no other hands, so I'll bring it back to council members. Uh, Jan, I'll start with that question that, that we just got from the public. The, the comment was made that you don't owe the people what was negotiated prior. Can you talk about the legal landscape around pensions in California? Do we owe people what was previously negotiated? Um, you'll recall the slide where I talked about pension reforms and referred to you know, classic employees, those benefits, and I believe it's been tested in the courts um, as recently, I wanna say Stockton, when it went through its bankruptcy, I may be wrong, but yes, those are commitments. And yes, the city is legally responsible. You know, people came to work for a variety of reasons, but certain promises were made. And, um, and so, yes, those benefits are not alterable. I appreciate that. I just want to make sure we're really clear because I hear this a lot from folks in the public. The current legal landscape in California says that we cannot reduce the benefits or the pay that was negotiated by previous employees. Well, I, I, the prior to 2012 or 2013, those benefits are not alterable. Yeah. You can do something going forward, but those are not alterable. And yes, I think this, I think if you tested it in court, you would find that the city has an obligation to pay. Great, thank you. Councilor, were there any other questions? All right, Jan, can you remind us what direction you're looking for from council today? So the, Items one through 12 are a variety of strategies. Um, I think that work as a cohesive um, pursuit for addressing the long, I, this is no quick plan. This is over time and it requires patience and it requires commitment. I'm not gonna say any of this is easy. And so, you know, there, there are different strategies. They're not one size fit all. 
And I think all of these we could do um, and implement perhaps over the next year, the next two. And um, I would recommend that we adopt them. We're writing a general fund or the fund balance policy or modifying it. You know, it's easy enough for us to add. Many cities in California have, have you know, adopted a pension funding policy. Doesn't have to be a lot. It could be as simple as a number a year, a million, half a million, some number that becomes an expense item like other expenses are that we spend money on, but that we are committed to. So I would recommend that, yeah, that you direct us to implement um, as much of these as we can, including the validation process and come back to council at that time before beginning the validation process and then and go through that process. You have a whole nother bite at that apple when the validation, when the summary judgment is issued and you see a plan of finance, and we'll be communicating in between then um, and what that looks like and how much that might look like to make any recent resolution um, to the UAL challenge. Okay, I'll start with council members on Zoom. Council member Sawyer. Thank you, Mayor. Well, I am um, of a mind to leave future councils with a path. And I am looking at this path and it was clearly articulated that it is not an easy one, but it requires commitment. Um, uh, constant commitment uh, on an annual basis with our, or even even more frequent than that, in our budget conversations. So I would be looking uh, to move forward um, with the validation process and then reevaluate that after the, um, if the conditions still warrant moving forward. Uh, with a POB and uh, get on a path to giving a gift of councils decades from now, uh, a gift of, of a, a budget that allows them to not have this dark cloud hanging over their heads the way it has hung over our heads for many, many years. So I need to listen and want to listen to my subject matter expert and start the process um, that will potentially, will hopefully have the right formula to allow councils in the future to not, again, to not have this uh, really major and at times devastating cloud hanging over their heads. I'm willing to make the current sacrifices um, and take responsibility for those uh, in the, for, the, for the good of our organization and the good of our city. Council Member Fleming. I concur with Council Member Sawyer. I, however, I would be uh, far a little bit less than truthful if I didn't admit that this process gives me some anxiety in terms of the downside risks. However, I think if we don't do something, you know, I was talking with a constituent last week and he said, I said to him, you know, one of the issues is that if we don't address this, you know, we're not going to be able to pave roads or pay for as many parks. He's like, well, why are you making threats, you know? And I said, we're not, I'm, it's not a threat. It's happening currently that we're not paying for every street to get paved or every park to get finished that we would like to have. And, and we simply can't continue on like this. It's it's the reality now. So I'm eager to, to lessen the pain and shorten the duration that we suffer as a city. And I'm, I'm um, anxious, but willing to take on that risk. Thank you, council member. Council member Spudhelm. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Jan, I have one question. A, I'm very supportive of this 12-step methodology, but step one, the whole how much issue, how and when would we be having that discussion? 
council member, if I can get you to, I, I had a hard time hearing. How much what? So it's the first step. So I'm very supportive and I, I'm, thank you for the yeah. comprehensive presentation. But the second paragraph, both budgetary and financial considerations weighing decision regarding how much to issue. When do we have that discussion? Because that's the part that, to me, that seems like the first bite of the apple. You know, I, I, I probably could have a preliminary discussion when we come back um, to initiate documents, because we will have at that point, like a recommendation of not to exceed amount. Um, I think we'll have it as early as then. Okay, and would that first go before the long range financial planning and audit subcommittee or directly to council? Yeah, the, well, once that, so that go, no, so that would go directly to the city council because it's just, it's the validation you're authorizing. We could, in between, as we work through a plan of finance, come back to the long range planning committee um, when we firm that up. But in any event, we have to return even post validation, but there are any number of steps we could take in between to say, here's the, what we're looking at. Is this comfortable? You know, perhaps in month two down the road. Um, yeah, it, it's not gonna be hard for us to do that, but we'll have a really good idea, frankly, um, during the um, validation process, or at least, yeah, I'll, I'll have a comfortable idea of where we might be thinking about heading. Okay, and how complicated is setting up the, the establishment of the RS 115 trust? Because I really like Very that concept. Easy. Great. It's easy. PFM will do it. Okay, thank you so yeah. much for this. Um, I appreciate this process and keeping it in front of us because as my colleagues have said, this is challenging, uh, but we do have, a, this is the first time I've seen a comprehensive strategy actually do something about it, a plan of action. So I really appreciate this information. Thanks. Vice Mayor. Um, thank you for the presentation for the strategy and thank you for putting it in terms that I think uh, I can follow and hopefully uh, the public can follow. Um, I definitely like it. I like that we have a plan. Um, I can stand behind it. My hope is that uh, we can stick with it and that if we start to see, or when we start to see savings and we're not paying uh, increased payments, that we definitely stick to the plan and that we don't find uh, ways to spend the money that we uh, see saved um, on other, other expenses. Um, so that would be my only concern. And I, I also do, um, have some anxiety about this whole process by uh, reading some of the emails that I've received um, from the public about their concerns regarding the pension obligation bonds and me not being as versed in, in that subject. So thank you. And I'm going to agree with the comments from my colleagues. Uh, there was in particular one correspondence that I think all of us received uh, from somebody who uh, amounted this to a bet. Uh, and it does seem like the bet that the council would be making is that the average rate of return for the lifetime of the, the pension obligation bond would be uh, over the three and a half percent that we expect or that we see, which is the, the percentage uh, that you expect to have on the bonds. It, I think that we can continue to talk about whether that's a good bet. I think that there's people who make predictions about what the market is going to do every single day who are wrong. Uh, and I think what we can provide is the best guess and the best path moving forward for our community. Uh, and as you said, get the, the ball rolling so that we can have the conversation about actual issuance down the road. What I'm also very aware of is that this council, uh, and not all of the council members who are currently on, but since I've been on, has gone to the public and has asked them to reauthorize a tax measure before. And part of that was a, a promise from this city that we would take steps to try to address our unfunded liability. And we said to the public, give us a runway where we know that we have pensions that are crowding out our services. Give us a runway and we'll put forward a plan on how we're going to not just meet our obligations, but hopefully allow that tax measure to expire ultimately as well. This to me is, 
uh, part of keeping that promise by coming back with a plan, a multi-step plan, that we can say to the public, we understand that there's risk, but we think that it's a calculated risk that puts us in the best position long-term for this city. And as you said, Jan, doing nothing is gonna cost over $110 million uh, to this city. So good work to you and your team. We really appreciate it. I know we've seen this a couple of times. I know we'll continue to see it at the Long-Term Finance Committee, but I think you have unanimous direction from the council on this. Thank you, council members. So council, it's four o'clock, so we'll move into our regular council agenda. Uh, if you need to take a quick break, go ahead, but I'm gonna just keep things moving. Uh, Madam City Clerk, do we need to take a roll call vote, vote f uh, to establish quorum for this since we're continuing to move? No, you don't, because we've not uh, taken a break. Excellent, Madam City Attorney. Do you want to report out from our closed session? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the council met in closed session this afternoon on uh, item 2.1, which concerns labor negotiations. The council heard from the negotiators and gave direction to them. Thank you. Great. I'll go ahead and pause and see if there's any public comment on the city attorney's report out from closed session. And seeing none, both in the chambers and Zoom, we'll continue to keep moving forward. Go on to item number six, that's our proclamation. Yes, good afternoon, Mayor and uh, Vice Mayor and Council Members. Uh, we have one proclamation today uh, for the Pollution Prevention Week and Creek Week, and C Kitty Robinson from our Santa Rosa Water Department will be accepting that proclamation. Excellent. I'm looking to see, I don't think I have uh, any council member that was assigned to this. So I'll look over to my right and see if council member Schwedhelm can please read the proclamation. Absolutely, Mr. Mayor, thank you for the opportunity. So I'll read this proclamation. Whereas throughout the United States, the week starting on the third Monday of September is recognized as National Pollution Prevention Week. And whereas throughout much of California, including the Russian River watershed, cities, counties, and other stewardship organizations are recognized in the fourth week of September as Creek Week. And whereas our pollution prevention practices are intrinsically linked to the health of our watershed lands and waterways, and whereas the city of Santa Rosa supports programs to reduce pollution, improve the environmental quality of our watershed, and provide our communities with the knowledge to be effective stewards of the Russian River watershed lands and waterways, and whereas the nearly 1,500 square miles of lands, 238 creeks, and approximately 350,000 residents of the Russian River watershed are connected and mutually support each other, making the Russian River, along with its tributaries and associated features, important resources to the people of Sonoma and Mendocino counties. And whereas pollution in the form of trash and debris, chemicals from industry and everyday living, and sediment from construction and many land uses and activities, all have the potential to degrade the quality of life and the quality of resources within the Russian River watershed. And whereas the city of Santa Rosa through our storm water management program strives to protect our lands and waterways through ongoing pollution prevention outreach, which aims to raise awareness of the harmful effects of pollutants to our natural systems. Now, therefore, be it resolved that Chris Rogers, mayor of the city of Santa Rosa, on behalf of the entire city council, ask all members of our community to support efforts to protect and enrich our watershed health by participating in the many pollution prevention week Creek Week activities and to take active steps to reduce pollution and care for our environment throughout the year and do hereby proclaim the week of September 19th through the 24th, 2021 and the week of September 18th through the 25th, 2021 as Pollution Prevention Week and Creek Week. Thank you so much, Council Member. I'll give Katie Robinson a chance to un... There we go. Uh, Katie, if you wanna say a few words. Absolutely. Thank you, Council Member Schwedhelm. Uh, for over a decade, Creek Week has offered fun educational events and volunteer creek cleanups. This year, we are encouraging citizens to join in the Creek Week festivities in their local neighborhoods and from the comfort of their homes. By visiting srcity.org slash creekweek, citizens can learn how they can keep their local creeks clean and find fun and engaging activities to participate in such as house, household-led neighborhood creek cleanups, an online cleanup competition, a virtual Santa Rosa Creek tour, 
printable kids scavenger hunts, a Creek Week webinar, downloadable Creek Trail maps, and much more. And I'd like to thank you guys for your time, and I hope you'll visit srcity.org slash Creek Week to see how you can get involved. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katie. We'll go to public comment on this item. It's item number six, our proclamations. We'll start here in the chambers with Dwayne DeWitt. Thank you, sir. My name is Dwayne DeWitt. I'm from Roseland. This is a wonderful proclamation. And over in Roseland for over 20 years, we've been doing creek cleanups along the Roseland Creek. It's really an important thing to keep in mind right now during these difficult economic times with many people living outside, they're choosing creeks as places to stay. And part of this pollution effort to prevent it talks about everyday living. One of the unfortunate things that's happening at Roseland Creek and perhaps at other creeks, I thought at Doyle Park had happened for a while, is the people who are staying in the creeks are leaving human waste, not just solid waste, but the things that humans do, urine and defecation. It goes out into the Russian River watershed. We haven't had rain for a while, so we've been blessed in that one sense that a drought is actually keeping pollution from reaching the Russian River watershed below Roseland Creek. I'm really so glad you're doing this because also today at the Board of Supervisors, Grant Davis from the Sonoma County Water Agency was there to talk about another matter. And he and I talked about the idea that's been talked of for decades for the city to partner with the water agency, now called Sonoma Water, which owns a piece of land right at McMinn Avenue along Roseland Creek, and then it goes to the west where the city now has bought land. So you'd hope there would be some sort of a collaborative effort like this proclamation talks about working with Sonoma Water and that land on Roseland Creek. Now's the time that you can do it. This excellent proclamation is going to be an impetus for our local neighbors out there in Roseland to get back out there again and do some things now that COVID is lifting. There had been a concern due to the fact that some of those folks I mentioned earlier were living in the Creek area and out in our neighborhood people weren't going out there to do the cleanups we used to do. They were not feeling safe. So I'm hoping that this proclamation, which I'm gonna send out to all the people that I know in our groups, is going to be that stimulus to bring folks back out there to do the good work that they've done on pollution prevention in the Roseland Creek watershed, which is part of the Russian River watershed, and the Creek Week activities which Alistair Blythus has helped us with so much in the past, a really good man doing really good things, and we look forward to working with him again. And I won't try to take any extra seconds up there, Mayor. I see you looking at that clock like, whoa, baby, it stopped for a moment. I will stop on time. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it, Mr. DeWitt. Just want to make sure we're fair to everybody. Let's move on then, Council, to item number seven. That's our staff briefings. Mr. Assistant City Manager, go ahead and take it away. Yes, thank you. We have two staff briefings today. The first we'll talk about COVID uh, update. Um, on Thursday, September 9th, President Biden provided vaccine requirements as part of his path out of the pandemic action plan, which covers the following groups. All federal workers and contractors, healthcare workers in hospitals, clinics, and other facilities that accept Medicare and Medicaid payments must get vaccinated. Employees of Head Start Early Childhood early childhood education and other federal education programs. Private employers with 100 or more workers will have to require their employees to be vaccinated or tested weekly. The requirements for private employers are similar to the executive order issued by Governor Newsom for California state employees, healthcare workers and school district workers, and to the policy implemented for Santa Rosa city employees. The president's plan also requires employers to provide paid time off for vaccination. The White House estimates that this action will impact over 80 million workers. Additionally, the president's plan urges all governors to mandate vaccinations for school district employees at the state level. And stadiums, concert halls, and other large venues across the country are urged to require proof of vaccination or a recent negative COVID test. 
Our second staff briefing is the Community Empowerment Plan update. Uh, Magali Teyas, our De Deputy Director of Community Engagement, will provide that update. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor Rogers, Vice Mayor Rogers, members of the Council. Uh, Magali Teyas here um, providing the Community Empowerment Plan update. Uh, starting with the Multicultural Roots Project, our team is partnering with the Museum of Sonoma County to feature the Multicultural Roots Project in the museum's Dia de los Muertos event. Uh, the exhibit will run from October 16th to November 7th. Uh, we will have an exhibit with a larger event to highlight community leaders who are no longer with us. And we'd like to encourage community members to visit the Multicultural Roots Project engagement page on Let's Connect SR to nominate a community leader, past or present, who you'd like to see highlighted. Regarding the Mary Lou Lowrider patrol car, um, the hydraulics have been installed, uh, body work and first round of paint are complete. The next steps is a pinstriping art, which will be done by artists from the Sonoma County Lowrider Council. And our team will also be holding a meeting with members of the Lowrider Council to discuss next steps. We're also working with the city communications team on a plan for keeping the community updated on the project um, through our different mediums. Um, in terms of the resolution declaring racism as a public health crisis, a draft resolution has been complete and we'll be meeting with SEED Collaborative to review the draft and determine the next steps to make sure it's in line with um, our previous uh, work as well as the community empowerment plan. Uh, we're working with a graduate intern from uh, University of San Francisco to develop an evaluation plan for the recommended activities and the resolution. Uh, we have a partnership. We're very excited. We have a partnership with Latino service providers, Youth Promotores. Um, so we are going to be partnering with their Pro Promotores program. So our office will be receiving three Pro Promotores and a small team, which will be a small team of youth, um, to help us with the creation of the Youth Citizens Guidebook and associated trainings and to help create a sub-project within the Multicultural Roots Project to capture the voices of BIPOC um, from select uh, neighborhoods throughout Santa Rosa and to capture ideas around cultural identity using an ethnographic approach to storytelling. And that is the end of my report. Thank you. Thank you so much, Director. I'll go ahead and see if there are any questions from Council on our staff briefings for today. Great, seeing none, I'll see if there's any public comment. Seeing none, we'll keep moving. Thank you so much, Director. We'll move on to City Manager and City Attorney reports. I'm gonna start with the City Attorney tonight. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm here uh, today to report on our settlements and our active litigation. Um, I actually have two settlements to report on. Um, the first is listed in our written report, uh, which is uh, the matter of Stamey versus City of Santa Rosa. Uh, that lawsuit arose out of the injuries, uh, out of some injuries that were incurred in last year's protests. Uh, the complaint alleged civil rights violations um, and the parties did negotiate and we reached a settlement. The settlement amount was $105,000. And uh, we did report out on that case um, previously. But I also want to report um, that the settlement reached a settlement agreement um, just in the last uh, few days with the Cal OSHA uh, with respect to the four citations uh, that Cal OSHA issued in September 2020. Uh, they issued it uh, in connection with COVID-19 and other health and safety violations, alleged violations, I should say. Um, so the citations, the four citations uh, stemmed from the Cal OSHA investigation uh, following the tragic death of um, Santa Rosa Police uh, Detective Mary Lou Armour uh, from a COVID-19 related uh, cause. Um, the four, again, uh, the Cal OSHA initially uh, issued four citations and sought $32,000 in penalties. Um, the, but the matter has been resolved, and I'll just walk through those five, four citations very quickly. The first citation was a regulatory offense related to record keeping. Um, that citation was the fine was reduced from $5,000 to $3,000. Two citations that related to the management of employees um, with COVID symptoms uh, were combined into uh, one and it was lowered from a citation to a notice in lieu of citation. 
uh, which Cal OSHA defines as not having had uh, any direct relationship to the health or safety of employees. And in those two instances, Cal OSHA agreed to waive all penalties. Um, and I will note uh, with respect to that, um, Mary Lou Armour's uh, death came very, very early in the pandemic uh, in uh, middle, late March, uh, when uh, before health orders had been issued um, and uh, we were all new uh, to the pandemic and, uh, and working through it. But we did take all appropriate steps at that time and Cal OSHA ended up agreeing, uh, issuing the notice in lieu of citation and waiving all penalties. The final citation was for a violation of um, the, the depart police department's own fit testing procedure, which outlines the procedures for ensuring um, that individual respiratory safety equipment fits up appropriately. The infraction, uh, as soon as we learned it, of it, in fact, before uh, Cal OSHA even issued any citations, we did correct and uh, brought uh, our team into uh, full compliance with our uh, procedures as written. Cal OSHA has reduced the fine by 50%. Originally, it was going to be 13500 and it was reduced to $6,750. So uh, in total, under that settlement, um, Santa Rosa will pay $9,750 in adjusted penalties. Um, we are releasing, uh, again, that just uh, got finally resolved over the last few days, uh, and the Cal OSHA order uh, uh, is being circulated now. So it has been signed and is being circulated. So those are the two settlements that I wanted to report out. Um, and then I'll just mention quickly as to ongoing litigation. Um, we have uh, five, there's not a lot of change from last month, but uh, just to run through it, we have five receivership cases underway. We have 13 general litigation matters, and those range from a couple of breach of contract cases, CEQA lawsuits, Public Records Act claims, civil rights claims, a uh, Prop 218 case, uh, a case that regarding prevailing wages, and a number of other uh, uh, claims in that group. We have seven active uh, personal injury cases uh, currently being litigated, and we have three cases that have arisen out of police actions. We have several trials coming up in November uh, and, uh, and in the next few months after November up until into January. Um, and I'll also note, as I will every month, that this list is not comprehensive of all the work that our litigation team does. Um, the team continues its work in code enforcement, uh, handling quite a few cases in code enforcement. We list the receivership cases, but we don't list the general code enforcement cases. Uh, pitches motions are ongoing, uh, weapons matters, vicious animals, and a number of other uh, categories of either court proceedings or cases. Uh, those are not included in the report. Happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you. Are there any questions for the city attorney? Seeing none, we'll move on to our assistant city manager filling in today. Thank you, and I have no update for today. Great. We'll see if there's any public comment on item number eight. That's the city manager and city attorney's reports. Seeing nobody move in the chambers, and I'm seeing no hands on Zoom. Council, do we have any statements of abstention tonight? All right, seeing none, we'll move on to mayors and council member reports. Who would like to begin? Council Member Sawyer. Thank you, Mayor. Um, well, I'll kick it off with my appointments to the Charter Review Committee. Um, I'll be appointing Patty Sisko, Yvette Minor, and Scott Bartley to that body. And secondly, um, I'm going to be asking our Economic Development Division Director, Raisa De La Rosa, to report on our discussions today with our economic development subcommittee. Uh, thank you, Council Member Sawyer and Mayor Rogers for allowing me to provide this summary. So um, we had three items on the economic development subcommittee agenda today. 
The first was an update on how the relatively new state surplus land act process applies uh, to the city's interest in potential infill development on select uh, downtown parking assets. So specifically, uh, we discussed the Third Street Garage in lots 10 and 11, which are the small surface lots on Fifth Street uh, behind the, the Fourth Street facing businesses. We uh, expect an item to come before council within the year asking to declare these sites surplus. However, it uh, has to be understood that this is really a technical category uh, defined by the state uh, and simply allows the city a pathway forward through the surplus land act process. So uh, to be clear, because uh, I think this is an issue that concerns people as discussed in the economic development subcommittee today, staff's direction continues to be that uh, replacement parking will be a requirement of any potential redevelopment of any parking asset in the downtown. So the second item uh, that was discussed um, is the proposed short-term rental ordinance for which staff will bring an urgency ordinance to council on October 12th, um, and that will address the most pressing life safety, uh, public peace, public peace, and welfare issues that we've uh, heard from the community. Um, this will likely manifest in policies relating to occupancy limits, parking requirements, noise, and life safety. But what this urgency ordinance does is, is it allows staff to continue working on a comprehensive ordinance. And um, we anticipate being able to bring that ordinance to council for consideration in early 2022. Uh, this is a really complicated item and a comprehensive ordinance will allow for more analysis uh, of the issues as well as more community dialogue. And um, I have to say uh, in terms of input that we've received so far, uh, the community survey that went out uh, recently uh, garnered the second largest number of responses ever recorded by the city. And we had nearly 2,400 respondents and about 1,700 individual uh, comments were submitted within that survey, uh, resulting in 164 pages of survey data uh, for staff, staff to sift through. And then the final item on the agenda was an update on the child care support program uh, that council judiciously allocated $2 million of one-time funds uh, to early in the pandemic. Um, this was something that we developed in the early days um, of COVID uh, through the Economic Recovery Task Force with Council Members Sawyer and Fleming. And this is a, a three-part program consisting of the Resiliency Fund, Facility Fund, and an employer-supported uh, child care. So of the $2 million allocated, $100,000 was given to 4Cs to help address the early childhood uh, education teacher pipeline. And that's being used uh, by 4Cs to expand their teacher trainings and assist uh, new providers with, with licensing requirements. And then um, $500,000 was put toward the Resilience Fund, which was administered or is administered by First Five. Um, they, I have to say, did just an amazing uh, job leveraging the city funds to attract additional contributions. Uh, so uh, the fund uh, ended up being just over a million dollars uh, with contributions from the Community Foundation, as well as First Five's um, own funds. And then the purpose of that resiliency fund was uh, grants, um, and those grants uh, were to help financially stabilize uh, child care providers to remain open throughout and after the pandemic, because at that time, if you recall, uh, we were losing so many of our child care providers, either temporarily or permanently. And then um, while the uh, city's contribution uh, could only be used for grants provided to, uh, to businesses within city limits, um, of the uh, 180 child care providers who received grants, about 75% of them, uh, or 134 of them, um, are went to businesses located in Santa Rosa. So again, we couldn't have done that without leveraging the funds. 80% of the applications were completed in English and 20% and 20 of the applications were in Spanish. 62% went to licensed home child care and 30% went to uh, licensed child care centers. There were over 6,000 children in care among all of the awarded providers. And then lastly, um, the facility fund. And this is the uh, where the remaining $1.4 million of the city's allocated uh, funds will be used. 
um, it's to seed the establishment of a low or no interest uh, tenant improvement revolving loan fund. Um, we're choosing a loan, a revolving loan fund instead of a grant because we want the funds to perpetuate themselves um, uh, since it, it was a one-time allocation. Uh, staff is working again with First Five, the Santa Rosa Metro Chamber, and a select group of developers um, who are actively working to incorporate childcare into their projects. And it was uh, with this group that we identified a tenant improvement program as the most effective way uh, to uh, encourage new site development or to retain uh, existing facilities. So like the Resiliency Fund, our intent is to leverage the $1.4 million to attract additional investments. And then um, I just want to end on um, that we are trying something new with this program. So it's being developed in the model of centering equity. So in addition to those I've already mentioned, we folded in our equity officer, Sakura Shields, uh, into the group so that we can model uh, what this could look like for um, any uh, project or programs initiatives that we put out through economic development and as the city as a whole, as we look at our programs and policies generally. And that is the update from the Economic Development Subcommittee. Thank you, Director De La Rosa. Um, Council Member Fleming, do you have anything to add? Yes, I uh, want to thank both um, Director De La, or, um, Raisa. Thank you so much for all of your work. It, it's a bit of a mouthful there. Lovely last name. Though. <laughs> um, you know, you really had a vision on this, and and you you carried it out and. You know, it means so much to me to see us get to this point. And, you know, it couldn't have been done without the cooperation and input from Councilmember Sawyer. But it also should be noted that um, former Mayor Schwedhelm, now Councilmember Schwedhelm, you know, had the belief that this could work and and the leadership to encourage us to ask for that part of that allocation from that funding. And so a sincere thank you to him as well, as well as all of the partners in the community who made this possible. When we look at the numbers in the presentation today that we got and we saw how many children are actually benefiting from this and how many small businesses are propped up by this and then how many families get to go to work as a result of this, um, it makes me hopeful that what we do at the city level can can really make changes that are both equitable and economically sustainable. Well said, Council Member. Thank you very much. And thank you, Raisa, for the, all the work that you've done. And you and your team, thank you so much. Any other questions? You can speak at the appropriate time, Mr. DeWitt. We're not done with our reports yet. Are there any other reports? Council Member Schwedel. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yeah, two things. First, I want to report out on our white, uh, special water advisory committee meeting that we had yesterday. Uh, we had two items. The first item was to consider the methodology for allocation of water to contractors during a shortage. Uh, the WAC unanimously approved the new water shortage allocation methodology that will be used by Sonoma Water to allocate water to its water contract contractors throughout the remainder of the drought. The methodology takes into account various conditions, including previous conservation implementation and demand hardening, as well as local supplies of each water retailer. The WAC also recommended that the Sonoma Water Board of Directors also adopt this new methodology. Sonoma Water will be taking this to their board at today's Board of Directors meeting, and this did require a unanimous vote, which it was successful in achieving. And then Sonoma Water Climate Adoption Plan. Sonoma Water is developing a climate adaptation plan to consider the risk and assess the vulnerability of their water supply, sanitation, and flood management in relation to climate change. This plan will serve as the roadmap for developing, evaluating, and implementing adaptation strategies. The WAC was provided an overview of the plan, and the Sonoma Water Board of Directors will consider adoption of the plan at one of their meetings in October. In Consistent with what we heard with the pension obligation bonds, some of this methodology for determining water allocation is very complex, and the staff at Santa Rosa Water and Sonoma Water do a fantastic job to keep the board updated. And lastly, I also want to uh, identify my appointments to the Charter Review Committee, and that would be Karen Weeks, Abigail Cunningham, and Annie Barber. That's all we have. Thank you. Great. Vice Mayor, anything? 
Great. I'll report out on a couple of uh, community events that I was very excited and, and proud to attend over the weekend. Uh, first, I want to say congratulations to uh, both the Boys and Girls Club as well as our Measure O uh, Violence Prevention Partnership and uh, Community Engagement Teams. We had the graduation uh, distanced here at City Hall in the parking lot for our graduates during the REACH program. Uh, the REACH program is incarcerated youth who are being put on a path for a better and sustainable future. In fact, uh, recidivism rate is about 80% in our youth within two years, but those who make it through the program, uh, recidivism rate drops to about two and a half out of 10 uh, instead. So really a significant program that's having the impact that we intended to have, uh, which is providing folks with a second opportunity and putting them in a good position to succeed. We had five graduates, folks who had made it through and actually received their diplomas, their high school diplomas, uh, while they were incarcerated. And so that was just a fantastic event and a good opportunity to hear from them about what they wanted to do next and, and how they wanted to move forward and, and really uh, be a contributing uh, successful member of our community. The other event was yesterday. It was the ribbon cutting for the new Roseland Library. Uh, this is the new location, though not the permanent location. Uh, and I'm very proud to see many of my colleagues there and many community members who have been working on that issue for a number of years. Uh, as council will remember, we have set aside money to help build the permanent replacement. And so expect to see more from that and more ribbons hopefully to be cut here in the near future. Uh, lastly, I would also like to appoint uh, two of my folks to the Charter Review Committee. Those will be Logan Pitts and Lisa Badenfort, uh, with the third one still to come. Just as a heads up for Council, next week we will be bringing the item uh, for the chair position for Charter Review. I will be recommending Patty Sisko, who is appointed by Council Member Sawyer, to be the chair of that entity. And so there will be an item on the agenda next week uh, asking council to ratify that decision. Seeing no other hands from council members, we'll go to public comment on council member reports. Mr. DeWitt, did you want to go? I had not intended to speak, but I was surprised by one of the comments. My name is Dwayne DeWitt. I'm from Roseland. I have a real concern whenever some of the best real estate in downtown Santa Rosa could be described as surplus. This is a really interesting situation because if you'll remember, just a few years ago, 46 more parking spaces were put into Santa Rosa at the courthouse square because it was said more parking was needed downtown. The dilemma that comes about whenever you take a publicly owned asset, something that the taxpayers own, and declare it surplus is you may not be able to get the value for us owners. A classic example is the AT&T building. The taxpayers bought it at one price, and essentially it was given for a song to a local developer for less than the taxpayers paid. And we lost money on that situation. But people looked at it like, oh well, it's gonna be good economic development for the city. Actually, it helps that developer more than it helps us city residents and taxpayers. This could happen again with those two prime sites in downtown Santa Rosa. We have to really be on the lookout and make sure that they are properly appraised for the highest value so that the taxpayers are compensated fully, even if there's going to be more parking in whatever project comes forward. We have to avoid something that was brought out oh, a century ago or more in New York City with Tammany Hall. It was pointed out legal graft was occurring. People who knew about real estate dealings going on would tell other people and people were able to profit in a form of legal actions that were considered okay, but to many of us might seem unethical. So I'm really hoping that you, Mayor Rogers, especially, because you're an ethical guy and you're trying to do the right thing, that you're going to be on the lookout for this situation, because that did not happen with the AT&T building, and us taxpayers took it in the pants, and that's the wrong way. It's not supposed to go like that. We're supposed to come out ahead on any of these dealings with our assets 
being put forward in some sort of a negotiation situation. I want to thank you for being in Roseland yesterday at that temporary library's opening. I want to thank the city of Santa Rosa for putting forward the $10 million that was matched by a million from the state. So there's $11 million to go forward to build a new library over in Roseland. You know, it could be a part of that Santa Rosa downtown specific plan because that encompasses part of Sebastopol Road right there at Roberts Avenue. You guys got to look into that. You could save money and make money. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. DeWitt. Move on to item number 11, the approval of minutes. Council, we have uh, two sets of minutes from June 29th. That's our special meeting and our regular meeting. Were there any additions or amendments to those minutes? Seeing no hands, we'll see if there's any public comment on item 11. Okay. Seeing no one rise, we'll show those minutes adopted as presented uh, without objection. Mr. City Manager, item number 12. Thank you, Mayor. We have four items on the consent calendar today. Item 12.1 is a motion, authority to issue design build requests for proposals for Spring Creek Drive and Utah Court Asphalt Depression. Item 12.2, resolution, purchase order 164640, amendment, increase compensation for purchase of additional vehicles for the in response program. Item 12.3, resolution, city county, city county funding agreement for Samuel L. Jones Hall homeless shelter. And item 12.4, approval of the fourth amendment to the professional services agreement number F001748 with HROD Incorporated DBA MMO Partners. Thank you, Mr. Assistant City Manager. Are there any questions on the consent calendar from council? Are there any public comments on the four items on the consent calendar? See none on Zoom and none in the chambers. Madam Vice Mayor. I move items 12.1 through 12.4 and wait for the reading of the text. Second. We have a motion from the Vice Mayor and a second from Council Member Schwethelm. Uh, Madam City Clerk, could you please call the vote? Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Schwethelm? Aye. Council Member Sawyer? Aye. Council Member Fleming? Yes. Council Member Alvarez? Vice Mayor Rogers? Aye. Vice Mayor Rogers? Aye. Thank you. Mayor Rogers? Aye. Let the record show that that motion passes with five ayes with Council Members Alvarez and Council Member Tibbetts absent. Thank you. It's not yet five o'clock, so we'll go on to item 14.1 and come back for public comment for non-agenda items. Thank you, Mayor. Item 14.1 is a report item. 2021 Sonoma County Transportation Authority funding program call for projects fiscal year 2023 through fiscal year 2027 project priority lists and application authorization. Nancy Adams, our transportation planner, and Rachel Ede, our deputy director of transit, will be presenting. Good afternoon. I am waiting to see Nancy on the call here. Um, I think she will be joining shortly, but I can go ahead and get us started today uh, and I will turn it over to her. I'm just making sure she has not arrived. So good afternoon, Mayor uh, Rogers and members of the council. Nancy and I are here today to present the 2021 Sonoma County Transportation Authority call for projects for fiscal 23 through 27. And this is, uh, a call for projects is kind of a unique um, process that, that we haven't experienced in the, in, the, in the past. And we're here to bring you a set of project priority proposals for submission to this call for projects. Next slide, please. 
So the background for this is that SCTA is intending to develop a coordinated five-year funding strategy to program an estimated $70 million over the next few years to member agencies um, of SCTA. Next slide, please. So on August 9th, SCTA released a call for projects. Applications are due this week on Thursday. And through the upcoming uh, couple of months, SCTA board will approve first the STIP program of projects as a first step um, from the projects submitted to this call. And then subsequently, we'll be adopting um, uh, additional project uh, call for projects and releasing them uh, and programming the additional projects that are subject to this call um, or, or, or um, grant funding areas. Next slide, please. So the city of Santa Rosa is uh, allowed to submit top five priority projects to this call. Transit operators are also eligible to submit five projects. So what you will see today is the top five priorities for, uh, for roads, bikes, and pedestrians that Nancy's gonna present, as well as the top five priorities for transit that I'll present later in the presentation. Next slide, please. So there's an extensive policy background that we are uh, that is informing the project list we've developed for you here today. Uh, it includes the city's climate action plan, the North Santa Rosa stationary specific plan, the Roseland area and Sebastopol Road area specific plans, the bike and pedmaster plan, the Southeast Greenway, and the downtown stationary specific plan. So staff have used this policy context as a way to identify and prioritize projects in the list we'll present to you today. Next slide, please. So a series of ranking criteria were used to evaluate the projects. These included whether or not the projects are in priority development areas or opportunity zones. Um, they were also scored according to their, uh, their contributions to diversity, equity, and inclusivity, um, their consistency with the city's housing strategy and priority for downtown development, their um, potential uh, impact on climate action. And I'm seeing Nancy's joining. I'm going to turn it over to her in a minute. Um, how they contribute to the city's financial stability and economic development, recovery and resiliency, and whether or not they're catalytic in the sense that uh, 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 implementing the projects will cause other things to happen, other good things to happen in the city um, consistent with council goals. And Nancy, I see you've joined. I'd love to hand the presentation over to you at this point, if I may. Why don't we go to the next slide while we're waiting for Nancy, please. Well, I can talk about transit. So transit projects were also identified based on the eligibility for the funding sources, including in the call for the project, included in the call for projects and prioritized based on the ranking criteria just presented, um, as well as some considerations related to timing and phasing of implementation. So a consistent strategy was used overall between the road bike ped projects and the transit projects. I will comment that in the case of transit, um, there, there's only a subset of our, our capital and operating priorities that are eligible for the project, uh, the funding sources that are included in SCTA's call for projects. So that's sort of limited um, the scope of the transit projects to an extent. Um, Nancy, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I appreciate it. I uh, just had a little technical difficulty getting me logged in. So I'm here now. Um, so it's, it's actually a good, a good uh, segue for for me, um, I'll talk um, in, over the next few slides about um, the bicycle and pedestrian and roadway projects that we um, are um, preparing to submit to the SCT on Thursday. So um, a very quick turnaround for us. So the first one um, we're looking at is our what we're calling the bicycle and pedestrian uh, connection that um, ties in with our, our climate change um, uh, initiatives here at the city, and they're consistent with uh, the um, the countywide transportation moving forward of goals of 2050. So this is a an investment portfolio that um, we're uh, re requesting about 9.2 million dollars, and the lion's share of that is for the bicycle and pedestrian overcrossing. Uh, the council just uh, received a. An, an item here last month about the $12 million that we uh, received from the active transportation grant. So um, as the scale of this project is rather large, we need to leverage, you know, a variety of sources to, to fully fund the construction phase. So that's the, the lion's share of this one. And this project, um, using the criteria that uh, Rachel went over quickly, um, ranked at a 19.5, which was our highest ranked projects. Um, and it also includes some 
two uh, uh, pathway uh, connections there in the, the Roseland area and then one on um, Pearson Street, which is um, just uh, north of uh, a Third Street. Next slide, please. All right. The second project, uh, which ranked an 18, um, is an investment por portfolio for our, for our downtown that supports um, our housing and uh, densification uh, down in, in the downtown area, and of course our, our, tra our, our uh, transit uh, uh, operations. So this would um, be a, a five million dollar request that would fund uh, a couple of, of things: um, our downtown circulation, um, which would include B Street and Third Street some um, restriping of Mendocino Avenue between 4th and 10th Street, and then some um, operational um, enhancement at Dutton Avenue and Sebastopol Road. And we have a handful of uh, pavement rehabilitation uh, work that we'd like to also um, include in, in the downtown area as well. And all of this with the mind that we um, want to be able to support, um, you know, additional housing in the downtown and then help with the operations of our transit service, and then um, provide the you know the the um, uh, all other micro mobility uh, initiatives that we're we're considering in the downtown, like bike share and uh, scooters. So um, that would help um, you know pr promote those um, those activities within the downtown. So next slide, please. Nancy, uh, through the chair or through the mayor, can yes. I ask? You the question sure. is, the, what is the, did I miss it or what's the highest rank score? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. So the, um, they, they're in order, they're in order of, of how we, the, the five, we have five, as Rachel mentioned, that we're um, submitting. And so the first one was the uh, bike and ped connections that were in 19.5. Sorry, that one there. Yes. All right. And what is the highest score? That is the highest score. Oh, that is the high, oh, highest. Oh, out of out of twenty one, you can score okay, twenty one. Sorry, that's, sorry. <laughs> that's a, that was the answer. That's the answer. Okay. For. Got Thank it. You. Got it. Okay. All right. So let's uh, advance one more. Uh, here we go. So out of twenty one, this one ranked seventeen, and this is um uh, what we're calling um, an investment uh, uh, portfolio that will look at uh, of, of advancing some of our. Uh, policy decisions that came out of our climate action plan and our bicycle and pedestrian master plan. And really it's, this is about, uh, education and programs, um, that would help, you know, with our, with our bike share, with our vision zero, safe routes to school and our, um, operations of our signals. Actually, right now in our measure M program, we have a, an ongoing um, uh, part of our Measure M money that goes to the um, operations of our signals to make them operate not only for vehicles but also also for our pedestrians and and cyclists. Um, so it's a it's a kind of a continuation of a an, of an uh, existing Measure M um, uh, project that we would like to see forward uh, go forward with Go Sonoma, and this would be um, for five years. It would be a total of 1.5 million. So the annual request for this. Uh, project would be three hundred thousand dollars per year for five years. Next, next slide, please. And this one also scored seventeen. And this is um, you all probably know about this one. This is Hearn Avenue Interchange, and um, this this is a, a ten million dollar, uh, ten point three million dollar request. And this is this is a little bit broader because we've 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 done a lot of thinking about how we can make Hearn interchange a little more attractive for for outside funding agencies so what we've what we've done um, to embellish this and we did this for uh, a grant that we submitted in in um, in July to the to the federal government um, we added a, a class one pathway as part of the the um, interchange um, project so that would uh, it would also include this class one pathway and we would also um, make uh, make some uh, pavement rehabilitation on Hearn Avenue, and the pathway would connect up to the um, interchange, and it would go basically from the interchange down along Hearn Avenue um, up to the Smart um, Pathway. So it would make that connection to the Smart Pathway on Hearn Avenue, and then um, make uh, make it easy for cyclists to get and pedestrians to get um, access to the Smart Path. So next slide, please. 
So this is, I think, our last one. Yeah, this is um, an interesting one. It's it's um, a, a part of a, a the southeast, what I'm calling the Southeast Santa Rosa Multimodal um, Resiliency Corridor Enhancement. And this is uh, at Fourth and Farmers. And the why this is important to us, um, it's on the Sonoma County Transportation Authority regional list um, for a project initiation document. So this has to go through Caltrans. And we um, we we de we definitely have it on the list, and it, this just puts us in a queue for um, you know continuing to work on that, get that uh, project initiation document started, and really this is a pretty uh, pretty critical intersection, um, as, as you all know, um, with the fires. Um, Highway 12 has has become a very um, uh, tough road for for. Um, residents to get out of in, uh, in, in the events of fires. So this would help a little bit with the, the operations there at that uh, particular intersection. So um, I think that is all of my, I think the next one might be Rachel's. And yes, I would just add, I would just add just before Rachel, and I, I don't know if she mentioned it, but all of these projects come out of the, the, uh, the SCTA's countywide transportation plan. So that's pretty, that's very important. Um, I know this, this item was discussed at the, the SCTA board um, yesterday, and, you know, their staff was very clear that projects that um, all the locals are submitting need to be contained within that, that countywide transportation plan. So I'll stop there, and, and I think Rachel has one slide to talk through. Yeah, thank you, Nancy. So just to revisit the transit projects we're proposing, as I mentioned earlier, our list is, a, is more streamlined and a little bit more straightforward simply because, as I mentioned, uh, many of our projects, such as operating projects, aren't eligible for these funding sources. Um, all of these projects are, with, are included already within the countywide transportation plan, although the first project I'll talk about, the downtown station, uh, Santa Rosa transit facility study, is not explicitly identified in the CTP, but it, it would implement um, or help imp implement several projects that are included in the CTP. So I'll go ahead and go through our priority order here. So the first is this proposed transit facility study. This is a new project for us, but we think it's very timely and important for where the city is right now in terms of downtown development, as well as development of the transit system. So the idea behind this project is that, first of all, it would implement a recommendation from the downtown stationary specific plan that the city study uh, the location and potential for expansion of the current downtown transit mall and related facilities, recognizing the level of downtown development, transit-oriented development that's contemplated in that plan. How do we make sure we have that central transit facility that functions operationally and that meets the needs of, of those um, new developments? Um, so this study would also identify measures to improve connectivity between the transit mall and the downtown smart station, as well as enhance overall multimodal con uh, connectivity in the downtown area. Um, it could also identify in the design and infrastructure elements needed to ensure that the five transit operators serving the transit mall are able to get access in and out of the transit mall area uh, efficiently and in a timely fashion. Um, particularly in light of the proposed relocation of the county center adjacent to the transit mall, that's a tremendous opportunity, as you all know, but it does come with some challenges around um, ensuring that that transit level of service is not impacted. So part of the study would look at that as well. Um, and, and this is really intended to sort of, as I mentioned, a key piece of supporting the transit element of the transit oriented development. And we think it's an important project to move forward um, quickly so we begin, can begin to identify needs and then build those needs into our funding program going forward. The next two projects are both battery electric charging infrastructure projects. We've, we've broken them into two separate projects because the first one is kind of bite-sized, shovel-ready, ready to go, and we think it has a chance to compete well for those reasons. Um, this uh, project is about a quarter million dollar funding request that would complete the first phase of our uh, battery electric bus charging infrastructure at the yard. We've already invested a significant amount of funding and the project is underway. Uh, to build out the majority of that first phase. However, we're lacking funding for, um, for some of the charging units um, that, that are needed to complete uh, charging infrastructure for our first nine battery electric buses. So what this would do was would fund those two additional dual port, port chargers that would charge an additional um, four buses uh, to complete that nine bus deployment. The next project, the um, battery electric bus charging infrastructure phase two, is a larger request at 1.7 million. It's a more complicated project because it would actually require us to expand um, the footprint of the um, charging area to build out our next up to 10 
um, charging locations for uh, for 10 additional buses. So this is a longer term um, project, but it's important because that then gives us the charging capacity to move into that next phase of our fleet conversion for the, the portions of our transit fleet that will be due for replacement and sort of the latter part of this funding period of the SCTA call. And finally, we have the diesel to electric bus replacement project. This focuses on our 2011 fleet, which will be due for replacement in 2023 or beginning in 2023. Um, this is a big deal. Uh, as you all know, it's uh, significantly more expensive to purchase electric buses than diesel buses. So we have sort of a gap in funding um, to, to transition these, this portion of our fleet to all electric, but it's something that we've committed to do um, working with the council. At this point, we have um, quite a bit of funding that we either anticipate through our formula funds and as well as one competitive grant that will go towards this conversion, but we're short about $3 million, or we anticipate we'll be short about $3 million. So we're seeking funding to fill that gap so that we have a fully funded um, program to convert these vehicles uh, to battery electric. So uh, with that, I'll conclude the transit projects. Um, the total request then for transit equals about $5 million, which we think is a reasonable amount to um, build into the city's overall ask to complement the projects that Nancy presented. Next slide, please. Yeah, and so, so thanks, Rachel. And, and I'll just end with, um, you know, Rachel mentioned um, her, her ask and, and on, on the resolution, there are two tables. And if you'll notice, um, our ask uh, is about 31.4 million for all of our uh, roadway bike and ped projects. And if you look at, um, you know, and uh, how, how this could work, if, if you looked at our, our population share, um, we're at about 23, 24 million. So, um, it's, I think for us, we looked at trying to submit everything we thought we could, um, manage, um, within the next five years for our transportation investments. Because, um, once they do this call, um, and things are submitted on Thursday, there isn't another bite at the apple. So, you know, it's, it's, this is, we're kind of all in, um, and, and, and so we are a little bit more, um, but, I think there's going to be some conversations with our technical um, staff in, the, in public works. And um, so we wanted to be a little, little bit bold <laughs> going into this. And so anyway, so I will I'll add that other note and then just want tonight for council to um, to look at the, the resolution that's attached to your staff report and uh, approve, you know, the project priorities that Rachel and I have um, described to you this evening and, and asked that our city manager uh, submit these applications to, to SCTA. And um, I think we had a, a, a good conversation with the mayor and um, council member Alvarez, our SCTA representative and alternate um, earlier this month. Um, and we did go over the, these draft lists which are reflected in the staff report to the full council this evening. So with that, Mayor, I will hand it back to you for the council discussion. Uh, thank you so much, Rachel and Nancy. And, and yeah, I was going to mention that same, that same aspect as well. Really appreciated the two of you taking the time to walk myself and council member Alvarez through the different projects and the methodology. Uh, it is a priority for SCTA. And as you said, it's a, a one bite at the apple type situation. Uh, and, and any project that doesn't make, the, make it in by this Thursday is uh, not going to be included over the next couple of years. So really appreciate the work that you've done and, and the rest of your teams to put together what is, uh, I think, a really good list. I'll open it up for questions amongst council members. Council Member Schwedhelm. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you for the presentation. Um, I had a couple of questions on the ranking criteria in that process. First of all, who did the rankings to come up with this list? I didn't see that in the staff report. So this was all uh, generated by um, by staff, and and I think you might have recall that we we prepared something uh, um, uh, like this about two years ago, and what we did was uh, we we we, re we looked at the the ranking criteria, and we actually um, you know reviewed that and and made some revisions. Uh, we got some good input from. Uh, Claire Hartman's team, um, and we added the catalytic um, item to it, and um, they actually helped us in, you know, reviewing and assessing our ranking of the individual projects from from their side of the shop, which was very useful. So it's it's purely been a a, a staff effort to to um, 
identify these ranking criteria. And we did it mindful of the countywide transportation and the regional uh, plan bay area goals. And, and so we wanted to make sure that we were consistent with the things that they look for at the region and at um, SCTA. So hopefully that answers your question. And you might have just answered my next one. So is this the same criteria that other entities that are submitting projects for, they're using the same criteria that we used? You know, I'm not sure how all the other cities are specifically doing their, their evaluations, um, but I do know that SCTA, when they look at these applications from all the jurisdictions, those, those are the goals and the ranking criteria that they're going to use their own countywide transportation plan, which looks at equity, housing, uh, your priority development areas and, uh, climate, you know, getting this to, uh, 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 climate, uh, change of, of zero. And, and so they, these, that's, that's how they're going to look at it, but I'm not sure how um, or what approaches some of the other cities have used. Um, we're going to be talking about this um, next week with our, our public works um, folks. And so it'll be interesting to see how that conversation goes and how, what approaches the other cities use in the county. Great, thank you. And then my last question was on the new column of, well, I don't know if it's new, but the diversity, equity, inclusion um, priority. I know it's every project got the maximum points except the last one. Since this is a new area for me, can you tell me how the the group identified and categorized top scoring on all the projects with the DEI lens? So, so what we use for that one is um, there's there's things called uh, communities of concern or equity priority areas, and those are specifically designated areas um, at a regional level, and so we looked at where these projects were located and, and physically within those areas or not. And so forth and farmers, even it's not in um, most of the areas of, of equity and, and um, diversity are for the city are within the downtown area um, up in the North station area specific plan. And then um, the Roseland area. So when you get out into Bennett Valley and Oakmont and, you know, East Santa Rosa, Rincon Valley, those those designations don't exist, so that's why it doesn't score as high um, as as those uh, areas in the downtown and that are within the the um, these uh, equity priority areas. And, and Council Member Schwedhelm, if I could just chime in as well, I mean the, that particular project doesn't exist within a priority of a development area, um, nor is it identified in the Portrait of Sonoma County as an area uh, of of. Um, resource need. And so that's why that particular project was scored lower than the others. And I appreciate that. I guess my questions are coming from DEI. Each of those, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion are three different metrics and measuring them are different. And they've all been lumped into one. And the fact that all of them scored maximum points, again, this is new for the city of Santa Rosa. So I'm just trying to learn. So we're consistent across all evaluations as to when we say DEI, what does it mean? So you've and, helped clarify that with this project. And you're absolutely right. This is a new mm -hmm. criteria for, for all of us when we're looking at infrastructure investment. And, and it's something that's starting to work its way into uh, our day-to-day -day work. Uh, and this was our first take at trying to better understand how we can begin to incorporate incorporate uh, that concept into the, the prioritization um, protocol for various projects across the city. And so I think that's what, we, we gave it a shot. Um, we utilized some basic uh, criteria. Uh, we talked with uh, the mayor and council member Alvarez as an opportunity to try to see if we were even in the ballpark uh, of trying to, to create a scoring that made some sense. Um, but yes, you're absolutely right. This is a new uh, program for us, a new concept, a new criteria. And we're gonna be learning more about that over the course of the next couple of years as we create a broader citywide prioritization program that in, that that enhances what DEI might be within those criteria within that scoring and that that was another one of the reasons seeing who, who made the evaluations I would just offer if she wasn't involved our EEO officer being involved in these conversations because it, again I think she's got a different lens than maybe some of your staff have again it's new for all of us thank you thank you councilmember Fleming Yes, thank you. Um, my question is about the the fifth um, project that Nancy presented, the Farmers Lane and Fourth Street. I was just curious to know, since that's uh, intersection is such a great concern for my residents coming down from Alta Vista, Montecito Heights area, 
um, in an evacuation. Um, can you be specific about the improvements that are proposed um, at that intersection? So I'll, I'll, I'll make a stab at it. And, and Jason knows this project really well too, if he wants to add. So basically, you know how you come up uh, farmer's lane and you get approach um, uh, four street, which goes off to the right to, to highway 12. So there's only one lane that you can turn right there. Mm -hmm. And so people, um, you know, and I, I drive that way home uh, every night from work, but people, um, they, it, 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 it's a challenge. So what mm -hmm. this would do would make that a dual uh, right turn lane. And um, let's see, there may be, so this is where I, I, I may ask for Jason's <laughs> assistance on. And so we would do some operational, of course, um, changes to the, the operations of the signal. Um, I think uh, it may also include another left um, coming from like Oakmont um, going down south, what I call south. Um, there's a dual lefts right now. So I don't know, Jason, do you want to add anything else to, to the, the, the design of that um, intersection that I have missed? Yeah, Council Member Fleming, I mean, the, the, the primary goal is to, to increase the throughput, and the throughput typically is Farmers Lane to eastbound 12 and westbound 12 back to Farmers Lane southbound. And so, so we're trying to create more time for those movements to occur. The primary aspect is, as Nancy mentioned, is the northbound to eastbound dual right turn lanes. That mm -hmm. would be the first. The second would be enhancing the westbound to southbound movement. That could be extending the turn pockets longer so that you don't have interruption of the through movements. It could also be adding a third lane. Um, there was also a very brief feasibility analysis of the potential of utilizing a roundabout uh, in an effort to try to create more of a consistent movement through the intersection. Um, but, but all of those will be evaluated along with the retiming of the signal so that we can maximize throughput. Uh, yeah. We may also be looking at some pedestrian improvements to eliminate or minimize the type of pedestrian crossing needs. Um, we've talked about going under the bridge uh, in, in effort to get pedestrians along the creek instead of at grade with the roadway. So those are items that will be evaluated in more detail during the project initiation document. Uh, that mm -hmm. we hope to see uh, underway in the next 24 months. Okay, I just would like to, um, you know, say that, you know, I, I am sure that staff is considering the importance of the the westbound throughput at that intersection. Um, you know, it's a it's a great inconvenience the the northbound um, chokehold that Nancy referred to, but um, the, it's really dangerous the the lack of westbound throughput. So thank you for put, uh, proposing that project. Certainly understand. Any other questions from council members? Okay, we'll go to public comment on this item. If you're interested in providing public comment, either hit the raise hand feature on your Zoom. All right, and I see Eris Weaver. We'll start with Eris. Hi, this is Eris Weaver with the Sonoma County Bicycle Coalition. Um, I just wanted to say how happy I am to see uh, two specific projects on that list, the 101 um, overcrossing and the improvements on Hearn. One of the biggest challenges that I experience as a daily cyclist around the city and see other people do is that east-west getting past the freeway because there are just so few options for um, going across through there that aren't um, that aren't nasty. Uh, so I'm uh, happy about that and very much looking forward to um, to seeing those get implemented. Thanks. Thank you, Eris. I see no other hands on Zoom, so I'll come back to the chambers. Mr. DeWitt. Thank you. My name is Dwayne DeWitt. I'm from Roseland, and I wanted to make sure that <clears throat> It was called out by staff that they recognize Roseland is an area that should have some improvements. Unfortunately, these projects don't deal with one of the main things that was talked about for decades, and that's the Roseland Creek Bikeway Greenway. I have a map here from the Southwest Area Plan from 1995. Actually, 
the plan was put together in 93 to 94, 95. And it points out Roseland Creek as an area where a bikeway, greenway, would be going in in the future. The city convinced the Sonoma County Agricultural Preservation and Open Space District to spend $2.5 million to buy 5.9 acres on the south side of Roseland Creek between Burbank Avenue and McMinn Avenue over a decade ago, specifically stating at the time that that parcel was needed for the completion of the Roseland Creek Bikeway Greenway to go west. Roseland School District purchased land next to it. They've put in a bridge over the creek. They've been working on that project. From what staff has pulled together, it says they're going to work on walkways over in the Roseland area. So I would hope that you would designate to them and to Mr. Nutt here that a bikeway greenway is a walkway and that it's there for pedestrians also and that it should take a priority to try to get funding. I'll be speaking about this at SCTA meetings in the future, even as I like the fact they're going to improve Hearn Avenue perhaps, they've been talking about that for all 28 years of the Southwest Area Plan from back in 1993. So I understand things move slowly, but in 2004, the city paid $100,000 for a Roseland Creek concept plan in which it was called out to have the bikeway greenway go forward. All of staff's efforts over the years have pretty much looked over towards the east with the southeast greenway. And when we speak about it in their meetings, we point out that this Roseland Creek greenway bikeway needs to go forward. This is an area called out in the 2014 Portrait of Sonoma County as the most needed area, Roseland Creek, the most disadvantaged, underserved, overburdened community in the entire county at that time. Perhaps the new census will show something different, but I'm hoping you folks will step up and help us to get that Greenway bikeway on the south side of Roseland Creek as promised. Thank you, Mr. DeWitt. And I'll go Back to our Zoom, we had one additional hand pop up. It's the telephone number ending in 5104. Hello, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to point out first, uh, thank you to the Assistant City Manager for bringing forward the projects um, with the prioritization. And I just want to point out there's a great article in the Government Finance Officers Association uh, recent magazine or a periodical on prioritizing community values and capital budgeting. Uh, the City of Oakland was, a, was an example how to achieve uh, relative equity when budgeting for capital projects. And I know that was of interest to the council. I just wanted to point that out. Again, the city of Oakland um, was uh, lauded for their work in prioritizing projects. And maybe if, uh, if you can look into that, it would help. Also on the uh, city charter, section 10, uh, the council would, was to establish a district commission and then each year the council would allocate, uh, would, would uh, establish an allocation for public improvements in each district, which the district representatives would weigh in on. So if there was a joint exercise for uh, the community members that provide that input on how to prioritize capital projects, that would be great. I know it's a hard topic, and I uh, appreciate the Assistant City Manager for stepping up and uh, opening up that conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Was, was that Mark? Yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you for your comments. I'm going to bring it back to Council. And I do believe, Council Member Swethelm, if you could put a motion on the table. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I move a resolution of the City Council of the City of Santa Rosa approving the list of project priorities and authorizing the Assistant City Manager 
to submit project applications and related documents to the Sonoma County Transportation Authority, SCTA, for consideration in the 2021 SCTA funding program call for projects fiscal year 23 through fiscal year 27 and waive further reading in the text. Second. Motion by Council Member Swethelm with a second by Council Member Sawyer. Is there any additional discussion or questions, Council? Okay, seeing none, let's go ahead and call the vote, please. Council Member Schwedhelm? Aye. Council Member Sawyer? Aye. Council Member Fleming? Yes. Council Member Alvarez? Vice Mayor Rogers? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. That motion passes with five ayes with Council Member Alvarez and Council Member Tibbetts absent. Thank you again, Rachel and Nancy. Really good work. Really appreciate it. We'll jump back, Council, to item 13. That's public comment for non-agenda items. If folks have a comment that is not on today's agenda, you'll have three minutes to talk with the Council. Uh, because it's not on the agenda, we can't get into a back and forth. But if anybody has an issue they'd like to raise, feel free to hit the raise hand feature on Zoom or approach the podium in the Council Chambers. Mr. DeWitt. Hello, my name is Dwayne DeWitt and I'm from Roseland. I wanted to talk with you about something that came up. Oh, it started 28 years ago for me. Uh, 17 years ago, the city of Santa Rosa put forward a proposal for matching grant from the Ag and Open Space District for what was called the Colgan Creek Park and Preserve Project. In that same year was when the Roseland Creek concept plan was put forward by the same woman who worked for the city at the time, Ms. Sherry Emerson, who now works for the Agricultural Preservation Open Space District. The reason I mention these things is because the people of Roseland had been working on the idea that you could save nature and have a park and a preserve. And in our general plan, it states those types of things are allowable. In the comments and uh, responses to the final environmental impact report to the 1994 Southwest Santa Rosa area plan, a number of things were called out about how the Southwest area needed open space and not just parks to be utilized for recreation. In this document, which I hope you will look into your city's library, which they still have because I got the document from the city. The then director of county parks was named Jim Angelo. And he pointed out one of the most important things was to make sure that school districts were not able to count their land separately from the city as recreational and parkland. Since this document was brought out, what happened was the city changed its amount of open space and park land per 10,000 residents or 1,000 resident. And the numbers have gotten different than they were back then. Many schools do not open to allow the public to go onto their land until after school is out. Many uh, proposed parks and preserves did not come about. The Colgan Creek one, although millions and millions of dollars have been spent to help the creek, the park and the preserve have never gone forward and land that was proposed actually has been allowed to develop. So some people that live up in Roseland Creek, that disadvantaged neighborhood I talked with you about earlier, they've pointed out that they can't trust the system. And we have to ask you, our elected officials, to please make sure we get a nature preserve along with parks, neighborhood parks. We don't need just one more community park that 16,000 people in that one half mile are supposed to go to. We need numerous neighborhood parks and preserves. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. DeWitt. It's the only hand that I see for public comment, so I'll bring it back. Let's go on to item 15.1, our first public hearing of the evening.
Item 15.1 is a public hearing for 1225 Fulton Road rezoning. And Christina Timias, Timians is going to be uh, presenting. Thank you, Mayor Rogers and members of the City Council. This is 1225 Fulton, Fulton Road rezoning. Next slide, please. It's a city initiated rezoning from PD plan development to RR Rural Residential to allow a permanent child daycare facility to occupy a former prime, private meeting facility. Uh, no new construction is proposed. Uh, next slide, please. This is the project site. You can see it's at the um, dead end of West College Avenue at Fulton Road. It, uh, it was developed as a church. Uh, the church no longer occupies the property. Mm -hmm. The city acquired the property for a sewer lift station and um, has leased the church to a child care facility. The PD is very restrictive and only allows for a church on the site. Next slide, please. Here's a close up view of the former church now um, temporary child care facility. The city approved a temporary use permit to allow for the child care facility to operate at the location while the rezoning um, was underway. And next slide, please. Here is the general plan and zoning for the site. As you can see, it's part of a plan development connected with the houses to the north. Um, and there's a mixture of different housing types uh, surrounding the property. Next slide, please. Here is a street view of the um, former meeting facility. It has a lighted uh, a traffic light at the entrance. It allows for um, people to turn um, left or right out of the facility or out of the property. Next slide, please. And so here's a little bit of background. It was purchased in 2019 by the city um, after determining that the location would be suitable for a, a new sanitary sewer lift station. Uh, the city water department, after much consideration from the council and board of public utilities, chose the current tenant who had lost their location in the Tubbs fire uh, to lease uh, the existing church building. Next slide, please. Um, although the property was not zoned correctly for daycare use on August 28, 2019, uh, this, the Director of Planning and Economic Development approved uh, a temporary use permit for a child care facility. Um, this is possible with the understanding that the City Water Department would, need to, uh, would have needed to rezone the property within five years. So the TUP temporary use permit was good for approximately five years to allow for um, the city to initi initiate the rezoning process. Um, the uh, diagram that you see on your um, on the right there uh, shows the um, future sewer lift station, which could still be accommodated on the site, and the rezoning would not inhibit that the construction of the sewer lift station in the future. Next slide, please. Pursuant to CEQA guidelines section 15183I, no additional environmental review is required when rezoning for general plan consistency. So the RR zoning district is consistent with the uh, general plan designation for the site. Next slide, please. Uh, the Planning and Economic Development Department recommends that the planning, the planning that the city council um, by ordinance uh, rezone the property located at 1225 Fulton Road. Um, the Planning Commission um, by resolution uh, recommended that the council adopts the ordinance. Next slide, please. Uh, here is my name and contact information. Kristen A. Tumian, senior planner. My email is k-t-o-o-m-i-a-n-s at src.org. And my um, desk number is 707-543-4692. And just to add, I did receive some public comments via email and a few uh, via phone and both were supportive of the um, proposed use and were um, thrilled for a childcare facility to be at the location. That concludes staff presentation and I'm available for questions. 
Councillor, are there any questions? I'm seeing none. Let's go ahead and open it up for public comment on this item. If you're interested in speaking, hit the raise hand feature on Zoom. We'll start with Renee. Hi, I'm Renee Whitlock Hemsabon. I am uh, the co-director of um, Fulton Community School and Farm. Um, we have been operating under pandemic conditions since we opened, and um, it has been a really wonderful opportunity for families to be able to bring their children and feel a sense of normalcy. Um, I want to thank the City Council and the City of Santa Rosa and the Planning Department and the Water Department for looking at this as a, as a valuable um, component to our community. I am also the chair, or the co-chair of the Sonoma County Child Care Planning Council, and we are really looking at ways in which we can make change in our community and really deal with our child care crisis. And by using public facilities to do that, it really creates an opportunity for families and for providers to really provide high quality care. I will just make note that on this item um, at this site, all of our tenant improvements were done um, via from donations and uh, grants from our community. And um, we made a huge investment to make this happen. And we're really grateful for all the people that allowed this um, to, to happen. We still have a little bit of a hurdle ahead of us in our conditional use permit, as it is a quite expensive process. Um, but we feel that we will be able to um, move through that. So I just want to thank you, um, council members and staff, uh, for this opportunity for us. And um, we really look forward to working with the city more and creating a really special place for families. Thank you so much, Renee. We'll go to public comments in the chamber. Mr. DeWitt. Yes, sir. Thank you, Dwayne DeWitt from Roseland. I grew up with friends that went to the Thanksgiving Lutheran Church at that site that was purchased by the city for a sewer lift station. And when you hear this presentation today, you're glad to see these good things happening for child care and good things happening for the community. But I didn't hear anything said about how much rent is paid to the city for the use of this city land and for how long the agreement is because now it sounds like this is going to be a permanent installation at this site. From what she just said, the huge investment that they've made, it makes one begin to think that this child care site will be there now in perpetuity. I'm glad for that, if that's the case. I just need to know how they're going to be able to build the sewage lift station there and do it without having to relocate the child care center. And if they're going to have to move, are we going to be able to find another suitable spot for them there on the west side? I remember when the uh, first discussion occurred here and it was stated that they needed to get this as soon as possible because of the fire and I've been supportive of it, but at the same time, there are concerns in the community whenever you see a really nice spot like this, because that's a prime piece of real estate out there. And you want to make sure how's it going to be handled by the city and will it be done in an accountable and transparent manner so that all of us taxpayers will know that not only are we helping the children and the families that need child care, but also making sure that the taxpayers get a good return upon their investment because that's what this has been an investment by the city of Santa Rosa for a sewage lift station to be built. Please tell us when that's going to happen and how all these other things are going to occur. That was left out of the report. Thank you kindly. Thank you, Mr. DeWitt. I'll bring it back to council. Uh, council member Fleming, do you want to put a motion on the table for discussion? Indeed. Um, I'm proud to present an ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa amending Title 20 of the Santa Rosa City Code by reclassifying the property located at 1225 Fulton Road from the planned development to the res Rural Residential Zoning District file number REZ 20-004 and waive further reading of the text. Second. Second. 
I've got a motion by Councilmember Fleming and a second from the Vice Mayor. Is there any additional questions or discussion? Councilmember Fleming. Yeah, I do have a question for Ms. Tumians about the cost of the CUP and if, um, and just a general question, if um, the council, when they revisited any of the um, the demand fees following the Tubbs fire, if if the fees associated with child cares have been have been reviewed in that time period. I'm not aware of uh, the fee question, but the resilience city measures allows for uh, child care facilities um, to be approved with a minor use permit versus a major use permit. So the um, permitting requirement was lessened because of the resilient city measures. Um, I am not aware that the fees were altered. Do you have a sense of how much fees are, or how the fees are assessed or how much they are in these situations? I can look up the fee right now. That's okay. I just was curious to know. Um, it's just well, kind of a general question about. By re reducing it to a minor use permit, the fees are significantly lower or less than a major use permit. So mm -hmm. in some ways, um, by reducing the, the required permit, it does reduce um, the fees. And I'm wondering if somebody is here, whether it's you or someone else who could speak to um, the lease agreement, because um, I know that yes. we did enter into a lease agreement, and I think it's a fair question from the public uh, about how much uh, money we are receiving in, in return for our lease. Yes, uh, Jill Scott is an attendee and can answer that question. Thank you. She's being promoted now. Good evening, Council. Um, the um, lease for to child family daycare was approved by Council um, of several years ago. I think it was about two and a half years ago. Um, they do pay fair market value for the lease rate. We did have a separate outside appraisal done at the time. And the lease rate right now is a little over $5,500 a month, which is, um, as I said, fair market value. It's a 10-year lease with some options um, to extend. The, um, to Mr. DeWitt's question regarding the lift station, the lift station can be built without disruption to um, the child care center. And we've planned that all from the beginning and worked through this with Ms. Hemsworth. So I think we're in good shape. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions or comments from council? Okay, Madam City Clerk, if you could please call the vote. Thank you. Council Member Schwedhelm? Aye. Council Member Sawyer? Aye. Council Member Fleming? Yes. Council Member Alvarez? Aye. Vice Mayor Rogers? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. That motion passes with six ayes with Council Member Tibbetts absent. Thank you so much. Mr. Assistant City Manager, I think we will go on to item 15.2, and then after that item, we'll take a brief dinner break. Thank you very much, Mayor. Uh, our second public hearing of the night is the Eggert rezoning, and Ms. Tumians is back again to present this item. Kristen A, can you unmute? Apologies. Yes, this is the uh, 1434 Peterson Lane rezoning. Uh, next slide, please. This is a request, request to rezone a residential lot from R19 to the R16 zoning district to allow for a future two lot minor subdivision and the development of a single family residence on each lot um, and, and uh, accessory dwelling units for each lot as well. Next slide, please. This is the general location. Uh, the property is south of Guerneville Road um, on the east side of Peterson Lane in the center of that uh, map, the aerial. Next slide, please. Here's a close up. It's a um, property that's zoned R19, um, surrounded by um, uh, R19. But as you can see in the general vicinity, we have 
a small small lot subdivision to the west and um, some smaller lot subdivisions to the north. Um, it's adjacent on all three sides by a key lot. Um, next slide, please. Here's the general plan and zoning. So um, R1, both R16 and R19 um, are uh, conforming zonings to um, the low residential general plan zoning district. So the proposal to uh, rezone this property to R16 would be consistent with the general plan. Um, R1 R19, the R19 zoning district allows for properties um, up to 9,000 um, with a minimum lot size of 9,000 square feet. And R16 would allow um, lot sizes with a minimum of 6,000 square feet. And this lot is just over 12,000 um, square feet, so it would allow for the property to be divided in two. Next slide, please. Here's a um, proposal for the um, future lot lines showing the property divided in half, fronting on Peterson Lane, um, rectangular lots, um, with uh, garages and uh, proposed ADUs towards the back. Next slide, please. And pursuant to CEQA guideline section 15183I, no additional environmental review is required when rezoning for general plan consistency. Next slide, please. And the Planning Commission um, recommended that the council um, uh, introduce an ordinance to rezone the property. Um, staff did receive some comments during the planning commission, uh, before the planning commission meeting. Concerns were in regards to um, on-street parking, the concerns about you know, how many cars would park for each newly created lot. Um, there's also concerns about compatibility um, as far as dividing the property in half. Next slide, please. Uh, Planning staff recommends that the council ad uh, adopts the ordinance rezoning the property. And my contact information is displayed on this screen. And staff is available for questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you so much. Councilor, are there any questions? Okay, we'll go on to public comment on this and we will go ahead and open the public hearing. Is there anybody who, who wishes to speak on this item? I'm seeing nobody in the chambers and I'm seeing no hands on Zoom. So I will bring that back to the council. Council Member Swethelm, could you please put a motion on the table? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I introduce an ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa amending Title 20 of the Santa Rosa City Code by reclassifying the property located at 1434 Peterson Lane to the R-1-6 single family residential zoning district, file number REZ21-001 and waive further reading of the text. Second. Motion from council member Swethelm and a second from council member Sawyer. Are there any additional comments? All right, Madam City Clerk, could you please call the vote? Council member Swethelm. Aye. Council member Sawyer. Aye. Council Member Fleming? Yes. Council Member Alvarez? Council Member Alvarez? Can you, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay, perfect, thank you. Vice Mayor Rogers? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. That motion passes with six ayes with Council Member Tibbetts absent. Thank you. We will take a quick dinner break. We'll be back at 6.15.
Let's go ahead and resume our council meeting. Madam City Clerk, can you please call the roll? Yes. Council Member Schwedhelm? Here. Council Member Sawyer? Here. Thank you. Council Member Fleming? Here. Council Member Alvarez? Present. Vice Mayor Rogers? Present. Mayor Rogers? Here. Let the record show that all council members are present with the exception of council member Tibbetts who is absent for the meeting. Okay, we'll go on to item 14.2. Mr. Assistant City Manager. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, item 14.2 is a report item. Council direction to voting delegate for the League of California Cities 2021 annual conference regarding council position on the two resolutions coming before the League General Assembly. Adrian Mertens, our Chief Communication and Intergovernmental Relations Officer, will be presenting. Good evening, Mayor and Council members. Uh, item 14.2 is an opportunity to consider providing direction to the city's voting delegate for the League of California Cities 2021 Annual Conference. Next slide, please. So the League of California Cities, also known now as Cal Cities, is hosting their annual conference in Sacramento next Wednesday through Friday, September 22nd through the 24th. On the last day of the conference, the annual business meeting occurs and member cities take action on the conference resolutions. Uh, these resolutions will then serve as the policy guidance for Cal Cities throughout the year. Each city is allowed one, uh, one voting delegate for this resolution voting process. So at a recent city council meeting, the council approved Mayor Rogers to be Santa Rosa's voting delegate. And so this evening, council now has the opportunity to provide direction to the mayor for voting on the city's behalf on resolutions at the conference. So there are two Cal Cities resolutions up for consideration this year, and I will go through background on each of them. Next slide, please. So first is a resolution of Cal Cities calling on the state legislature to pass legislation that provides for a fair and equitable distribution of the Bradley Burns 1% local sales tax from in-state online purchases based on data where products are shipped to and that rightfully takes into consideration the impacts that fulfillment centers have on host cities, but also provides a fair share to California cities that do not and or cannot have a fulfillment center within their jurisdiction. Next slide, please. So the sponsoring agency for this resolution is the city of Rancho Cucamonga. The sponsor city submitted the resolution due to concerns over the concentration of sales tax revenue from in-state online sales being directed to cities that are home to fulfillment centers. And the city's concerns, uh, uh, city of Rancho Cucamonga's concerns are centered around a few points. The current tax distribution system deprives other neighboring jurisdictions of much needed revenue. Uh, but they're still subjected to the impacts the warehouse fulfillment centers create. Uh, this includes traffic, pollution, and road damage uh, without providing proper funds to address the concerns. Uh, some municipalities don't also have commercial space or option to host a fulfillment center, and so they're at a disadvantage to benefit from tax proceeds of in-state online sales. Next slide, please. So the, LL, uh, the league uh, does provide background and analysis of the proposed resolution, which I will summarize. Um, first, since the 1950s, cities have traditionally received one cent on every dollar of a sale made at a store, a restaurant, or other qualifying point of sale location within a jurisdiction's boundaries. Uh, this is known as the 1% Bradley Burns local sales and use tax. Over time, this, simple, this simplified structure has evolved into a much more complex structure of how sales and use tax allocation is managed in California. So both have the 1% value, but the tax is applied depending on where the transaction starts, where the goods are located, and how customers receive the goods. Uh, this evolution has ensured that online sales from out-of-state retailers would be subject to sales and use tax. These out-of-state retailers uh, do not have a, a physical presence in the state and ship goods from fulfillment centers within California that are operated by third parties. 
And due to the growth of online sales and the corresponding decline of in-store shopping, some cities see most of their sales tax growth actually coming from the countywide sales tax pools where much of the revenue from out-of-state sales has been allocated. Next slide, please. So toward the end of 2020, one of the world's largest out-of-state online retailers shifted its ownership structure to own and operate its own fulfillment centers within California. This resulted in its reclassification as an in-state retailer. Uh, per regulations that are set by the California Department of Tax and Fee Administration, sales tax generated by this retailer is now no longer collected in a countywide pool to be shared by jurisdictions, within that county, but it's solely allocated to the city in which the Warehouse Fulfillment Center is located. The change has resulted in more than 90% of California cities experiencing a decrease in sales tax revenue that began the fourth quarter of calendar year 2020. Uh, in their analysis, Cal Cities or League of California Cities has explained that Fluctuation in sales tax following the pandemic shutdowns have masked this issue, but it will have long-term impacts on revenues for all California cities as revenues have shifted to a handful of cities and counties that are home to these fulfillment centers rather than capturing revenues based on where the goods are purchased. Next slide, please. So each city may experience the impacts of this type of change differently. Uh, in many situations, entities without fulfillment centers may experience additional impacts from e-commerce and increased deliveries, including traffic, air quality, and compromised safety, as well as the overall negative impact on local brick and mortar businesses that are struggling to compete with a significant increase in online shopping. Um, it's also believed that these cities should be entitled to compensation and an equitable share of sales and use tax that balances the impacts to each jurisdiction involved in the distribution of the products that are then purchased online. Uh, next slide, please. So city staff did reach out to our city's consultant Avenue Analytics and Insights for their thoughts on this issue as it relates to Santa Rosa. Uh, from their perspective, the issue deserves further analysis and consideration. Um, therefore, they generally did advise support of the resolution. Um, incorporating such a stance, uh, they believe, into C Cal City's policy goals could allow for Cal Cities to more effectively advocate for an assessment of the existing tax structure, as well as a reevaluation of the allocation formula and a more equitable distribution of sales tax revenues that may ultimately benefit the city of Santa Rosa. Uh, the city's consultant acknowledged that Santa Rosa likely could see some benefits that were not present previously, but stressed that full data is not yet available and any benefits will completely depend on what is ultimately negotiated in any legislation that could be proposed for advancement by Cal cities and depending on what fair and equitable translates to in terms of any policy that's ultimately developed by the state legislature. Next slide, please. So moving on to resolution number two, uh, this one is a resolution calling upon the governor and the legislature to provide necessary funding for the California Public Utilities Commission, CPUC, to fulfill its obligation to inspect railroad lines to ensure that operators are removing illegal dumping graffiti and homeless encampments that degrade the quality of life and results in increased public safety concerns for communities and neighborhoods that abut the railroad right of way. Next slide, please. So for this uh, resolution, the city of Southgate is sponsor um, and brought this forward to Cal Cities to call attention to the lack of regulatory authority that local governments possess to conduct abatements along the railroad right of way and the lack of oversight to require railroad operators to conduct maintenance and cleanups on a regular basis or in a timely manner. Uh, state oversight of rail operations does fall under the CPUC and currently uh, the CPUC has 41 inspectors covering over 6,000 miles of railroad lines to ensure that equipment and bridges and lines are all operating safely. Next slide, please. So typically railroad right-of-way areas are open and therefore in some communities have been inviting to individuals to conduct illegal dumping and apply graffiti to structures. As is well known, many metro areas lack an, lack an adequate supply of affordable housing. Uh, this has also contributed to an increase in unsheltered individuals staying along railroad right-of-way areas. 
This, this situation does pose an increased safety risk to these individuals and unsafe work environments for railroad and agency personnel. Uh, while the CPUC cannot compel those experiencing homelessness to vacate railroad right-of-ways or create shelter for homeless individuals, uh, the agency does have the regulatory authority to enforce measures that can reduce safe, some safety issues created by encampments. Uh, this includes enforcement of violations, uh, excuse me, this includes violations of clearance standards between tracks, uh, structures, and obstructions adjacent to tracks, or the removal of tripping hazards along railroad right-of-way. Next slide, please. So for this resolution, the League also provided analysis summarizing the following current options that are available to cities uh, that are facing this issue. Um, since railroad property is considered private property, cities must arrange for staff to, to uh, access the site in coordination with the rail operator or wait weeks for the rail operator to schedule a cleanup. Um, a city may also elect to declare the encampment as a public nuisance area, allowing the city to clean up the area at the railroad company's expense. Um, the league also talked about how some cities have been successful in negotiating MOUs with railroad companies to provide graffiti abatement, trash, and debris, and debris removal located in the right-of-way and cleanups of homeless encampments as well. Uh, however, absent an MOU, which would de uh, detail the shared maintenance, the enforcement, and the expenses, uh, cities really lack the actual authority to address the public safety, environmental quality, and health impacts on the local community. Uh, one additional point that the LOC, uh, that the league, excuse me, acknowledged their analysis uh, was the recent state budget adoption, which includes a homelessness package of $12 billion. Uh, this consists of an, a commitment of $1 billion per year for direct and flexible funding to cities and counties to address homelessness. Uh, with regards to this particular resolution, the state budget also already does include $1.1 billion to clean trash and graffiti from highways, roads, and other public spaces by partnering with local governments to pick up trash and beautify downtowns, freeways, and neighborhoods across California. Next slide, please. Um, information was gathered from our city staff about this issue as it relates to Santa Rosa. Uh, the areas of 9th and Wilson Streets, Carrillo Street and Central Avenue, and south of Hearn Avenue were identified as locations near the SMART Railroad right-of-way where encampments are frequently established. Uh, SMART has installed some fencing along their property lines in Santa Rosa, and therefore staff did note that in most cases the encampments are actually on city or else private property just past the railroad rights-of-way and fence lines. Uh, SMART does also have a crew which actively patrols the railroad lines in Santa Rosa and is very proactive in calling dispatch whenever they find an encampment or subject, um, excuse me, whenever they find an, an encampment or there's trespassing on their property and they coordinate with SRPD's downtown enforcement team. Uh, each year through written authorization, SMART also does request the Santa Rosa Police Department to enforce occurrences of trespassing on the railway, as well as any other criminal actions which occur within its right of way. Next slide, please. Uh, it was acknowledged by all who provided input from the city team that anytime intensified pedestrian activity is present in the area of railroad lines, there's definitely an increased public safety concern. And the same is true even in in Santa Rosa with smart fencing in place. Uh, however, the proposed resolution as it's written does not appear to address the root of the issue here in Santa Rosa, which is really a lack of overall shelter and housing options across the region for our unsheltered community members. Next slide, please. So that completes summary of both resolutions. Um, there is no fiscal impact associated with providing direction to the voting delegate for these two resolutions. Next slide, please. And with that, I will read the recommendation. Um, it's recommended that the council by motion consider taking a position on the two proposed League of California cities resolutions. First, a resolution calling for a fair and equitable distribution of the Bradley Burns 1% local sales tax from in-state online purchases 
and second, a resolution calling upon the governor and the legislature to provide necessary funding for the CPUC to fulfill its obligation to inspect rail lines, and B, provide associated direction to its voting delegate for the upcoming meeting of the League General Assembly. Uh, the council may recommend that the council's voting delegate support, oppose, or take no position on uh, both of the resolutions. Uh, next slide, please. And that concludes my presentation, and I will turn it back to you, Mayor, for discussion. Thank you so much. Councilor, are there any questions on either of those items? We'll go with Council Member Fleming. Thank you. I'm curious to know how this, um, the Bradley Burns tax differs from the Wayfarer decision. Is it part of that or is it separate from that? So, yes. It's okay um, if you don't know. <laughs> yeah, I and I it don't know if anyone like from Wayfair. finance is on. I know the Wayfair decision was a 2018 decision, um, happened before uh, the 2020 change that I mentioned, which is Amazon, um, obviously. Um, honestly, I, I probably need a little help on that if there's somebody on. We'll see if we can get somebody to answer that question in a moment. Did you have any other questions, Councilmember Fleming? All right, we'll come back to that. Councilmember Sawyer? Thank you, Mayor. Um, Mayor, in your uh, work on the legislative subcommittee, or I think it's a subcommittee with the league or, or um, their new name, um, have you discussed the the second piece, the uh, the number two, and it's uh, whether it's what the what the effect is and whether it's really um, effective in Santa Rosa, or have you, have you had a discussion with your group? We haven't had a discussion specifically on this item. The way that the league is structured, you have um, you have your local committee where we talk about legislation that's working its way through that's sponsored by senators and assembly members. And then you talk about your areas of local concern um, where each city talks about the issues. And that's where homelessness has largely been brought up and where we have a chance to discuss the needs of cities with the legislative representatives who are on it. So from that direction, we've talked about it. This is a resolution that's coming specifically out of a policy group uh, that is uh, interested members apply to with the League of Cities and get appointed to. Uh, I serve as the chair of the Environmental Quality Committee. So we've talked a little bit about homelessness from an environmental interruption perspective not from this specific recommendation or the specific resolution that's coming forward. Uh, I will mention that uh, I'm also on the North Bay Executive Committee, uh, which ag again is mostly folks from kind of a broader region talking about legislation and talking about how these things move through. But this is the first time that I'll be seeing this item. Okay, thank you. Is there Assistant City Manager? Yes, Mayor. Um, Council Member Fleming, I'm wondering if you could provide some more information or some more detail on the nature of your question relating to the two acts. Mm, I was, perhaps I misunderstood or didn't, Adrienne said she explained a, a change and perhaps I missed the explanation. Um, I thought that the Wayfarer decision allocated tax funds back to the, um, the, lo the delivery location and that that had resolved this issue. And I was just curious uh, to understand how this differed from that. It's not really that important. It's just a matter of curiosity. I'm, I'm glad that we're addressing it if, if this is separate and, or exempt from Wayfair. I guess I, what I don't understand is how or how the Amazon issue separates itself from it. But don't need to take up council yeah. time over that. Council member, I'm happy to work with our, our chief financial officer and get a, a response back to you here in, the, in short order. Okay. And if I can take a stab at it really quickly, because I think I, as I understand it, you had the, Wayf the Wayfair decision that uh, first and foremost said that online goods needed to be taxed, uh, because remember that was a, a big sticking point was where was the point of sale? and the taxing entity, it would go back to the jurisdiction at the point of sale. My understanding is with this change, 
some groups such as Amazon are defining the point of sale as the, call it the distribution center where all of the goods are coming in and then being routed from there. And so the issue is that then that center, wherever, whatever city hosts that center, is the point of sale for the purposes of the Wayfair decision, which then allocates the funds to that city as opposed to evenly distributed amongst uh, the rest. Uh, Adrian, is, is that yeah, cool? yeah, and that is correct. I, I just did a quick control F in the 70 page league uh, council or resolution packet uh, wait, and Wayfair was um, referenced in there. So I, I did remember uh, that, um, but the mayor's correct. That is the difference and that, you know, the uh, companies like Amazon um, was a huge impact across the country. Um, is now setting up actual distribution sites within cities and their designation is now is changing and that's what's now changing the tax pool. Thank you, that's pretty clear, got it. Any other questions from council? Okay, we'll go ahead and open up public comment on the item. I'm seeing no hands on Zoom, nor am I seeing anybody in the chamber running to the microphone. So I'll bring it back. Councilmember Sawyer, would you like to make a motion? Sure, I will make a stab at this. Um, <clears throat> just, um, go, I'll introduce a resolution um, requesting a yes vote for a fair and equitable distribution of the Bradley Burns 1% local sales tax from, from in-state online purchases. And second, a yes vote on a resolution calling upon the governor and the legislature to provide necessary funding for a CPUC to fulfill its obligation to inspect railroad lines. Is there a second? Second. So motion from council member Sawyer and a second from council member Swedhelm. Is there any other questions on the motion or any other discussion? Okay, Madam city clerk, if you could please call the vote. Thank you, mayor. Council member Schwedhelm. Aye. Council member Sawyer. Aye. Council member Fleming. Yes. Council member Alvarez. Aye. Vice mayor Rogers. Aye. Mayor Rogers. Aye. That motion passes with six ayes with council member Tibbetts absent. Great. Thank you, Adrian. We really appreciate it. Thank you. We'll move on to item 14.3. Yes, thank you. Item 14.3 is a report response to the 2020-2021 Grand Jury Report Emergency Preparedness. I'm going to hand it over to uh, City Attorney Gallagher and she will introduce the item and Neil Bregman, our Emergency Preparedness Manager. Uh, thank you. Um, on June, this concerns the Grand Jury Report of the 2020-2021. Uh, on June 20th, 2021, the Sonoma County Civil Grand Jury issued its uh, final report for the year. And that report included reports on six separate grand jury investigations, including a report on the grand jury's investigation into the role and effectiveness of emergency alerts and communication systems throughout the county, countywide report. Uh, the grand jury did request the city respond to that report. Several of the findings and recommendations contained in that report. Um, we referred the report to Chief uh, Fire Chief uh, Westrope and to Emergency Manager Neil Bregman. And Mr. Bregman uh, prepared a response and I hand it over to him now. Thank you. Thank you, City Attorney. Uh, good evening, Mayor Rogers, Vice Mayor Rogers and esteemed council. Uh, next slide, please. So each year, the civil grand jury uh, investigates local government institutions on a variety of issues and comes up with findings and recommendations. Uh, as uh, city attorney uh, mentioned, uh, this year, one of the subjects, and there were many, were related to alert and warning in the county as a whole. Next slide, please. They went over different findings and, and we are required to respond. And, and so we submitted a response for the most part. Uh, all of the recommendations were already completed and we will continue to work on pursuing improvement to alert and warning on all of those that either are not completed or are ongoing. Next slide, please. We were required to submit a response and we have worked uh, to make sure that other staff have reviewed that, including my public information 
and communications team because many of the questions related to not just alert and warning but public information. Uh, we reviewed those and we have prepared a response for council to approve and review and then to be submitted by the mayor once it's approved. Next slide. So I'd be interested in hearing what you might need to say or have to say or what questions you might have. We have until September 18th. Uh, if you have reviewed the response I prepared and have any changes or edits or additions. Uh, otherwise, next slide. We would request that you recommend uh, by motion the the response uh, as written, but obviously if it is not to your liking or satisfaction or there's things you think that are missing, we're happy to change that in the next four days and add that in before we make a final submission. Next slide, please. And with that, that is the end of my very short presentation. I turn it over to the mayor for questions or a vote. Great, thank you so much, Neil. Uh, Neil, for the public's edification, could you give a quick synopsis of what the grand jury was curious about and what their recommendations were? Sure, so one of the, I'd say the biggest one was focusing on making sure that all members of our community in Sonoma County have one integrated map of the evacuation, designated evacuation zones. Uh, we had already published ours prior to that recommendation as well as the county. Um, and so a lot of it was just making sure that the civil grand jury is aware that each city has its own evacuation zone map. There is also a place where we've integrated all of those that lives on SoCo Emergency, which is the county's website to make sure that everyone has every zone they might ever want to look up and are aware of it. Uh, another area of interest for them was just making sure that all best practices are incorporated into our plans around alert and warning. We are always doing that. We are constantly doing what are called after action reports, not only on alert and warning, but all of our responses to major disasters. And anytime we have a area of improvement, we include that in our checklists, playbooks, and other plans. Uh, Sonoma County Grand Jury more or less wanted to make sure that we, we as a community of alert and warning first responders. We're looking at all those best practices and making sure that they've been incorporated into our plans. Uh, and then finally, uh, there was understandably great concern that we meet as many populations of our community where they are. In other words, making sure we're speaking to our Latinx community in Spanish, that we are translating if we need to for other languages, that we are working with our hard of hearing community. Whatever the access and functional need might be that might make it difficult for someone to receive the message. They refer to them as subpopulations, making sure that we are working with and keeping all of our subpopulations in mind to make sure that we can get the alert and warning messages to as many people as possible. And so we, in our response, go through all the tools we have and use, and that that is a constant improvement process. And we are always open to hearing other tips, ideas, or ways of making our system better. All right, thank you. Councilor, are there any questions? Seeing none, I'll go ahead and look for public comment. And again, seeing none, I'll bring it back. Council Member Schwedelm, you have this item. Thank you, and I do appreciate the response, uh, Mr. Bregman. Specifically, I know we had some community discussions about the sirens, and I think you did an excellent job explaining why that wouldn't be the best um, result here in Santa Rosa and Sonoma County, so thank you for that. Um, thank you. But I'll move by motion uh, that we authorize the mayor to provide formal response to the Sonoma County 2020-2021 grand jury report specifically about emergency alerts and communication toward a culture of preparedness. Second. second. Motion by Council Member Swedhelm, second by Council Member Sawyer. Any other comments? I just want to thank you, Mr. Bregman. That's uh, really appreciate the work that you have, have been doing since the 2017 fires that I think that you in your response really did a good job of explaining what the evolution has been here in Santa Rosa to make sure that we are prepared and that we are as safe as possible. I think you did a really good job on the response, so thank you. Uh, and, thank you very and thank you to everybody else who, who participated and helped out as well. With that, thank Madam you. Clerk, could you please call the vote? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Oh, excuse me.
Council Member Schwedhelm? Aye. Council Member, oh, excuse me. Council Member Sawyer? Aye. Council Member Fleming? Yes. Council Member Alvarez? Aye. Vice Mayor Rogers? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. That motion passes with six ayes with Council Member Tibbetts absent. Excellent. Thank you so much. And thank you, Neil. And thank you to everybody who worked on this. Have a great evening. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Mayor. We have no written communications tonight. We'll open up for our last public comment for non-agenda items. If you're interested in providing comment, go ahead and hit the raise hand feature on your Zoom. Council, I'm not seeing any. So with that, we'll go ahead and adjourn. Uh, it is uh, 6.45. If you haven't voted yet, you still have until 8 o'clock. Outside of that, we'll talk soon. <laughs>